Welcome to Hags Radio. This is the platform if you can sing, cook, or clean, and anything in between, it can be heard on HagsRadio.com. Hey, 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 everybody out there. My name is Greg Hags. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I always had a desire for people to be able to prosper and to make their dreams come true. And I'm glad to have this platform that God has blessed me on so that I can reach millions of people who has that desire and that dream. It's your boy, Will The Steel. I'm from Chicago. I'm a DJ, content creator, and entrepreneur. It's our mission to help you find tools to gain direction to navigate through life. Hey, 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 hey. Welcome to Hags Radio. Boom. You know, I have a special guest here today. Jeff Hunt. Jeff Hunt, man. And we're just going to share with you, man, because this is what this station is all about, bro. It's all about people sharing with people their experience, the, the things they went through. You know what I'm saying? That maybe some of these things that we go through every day can maybe enlighten or enhance or give you like you say, Will, to find directions in life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so Will came to me and said, and he said, man, I, I got a special friend, man, bro. His story is mad interesting. You can't just be saying special friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, on, on paper, we'll get to it. I am no, special. He's a good guy, though. He's a real good guy. <laughs> yeah, not special, special. <laughs> but he said that, you have a, a, a story that not only affect you, but probably affected a lot of people and in ways that they didn't even know. They probably didn't even find know the direction or why they was feeling or doing or what was happening was happening to them. They, 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 they didn't know. First off, let's start off with Jeff. Where are you from, man? I was born in uh, central Michigan, um, 1973. Uh, by 79, my family moved away to Tampa, uh, down to Florida. Um, I was born on a farm and then moved to a metropolitan area. So that was, you can imagine me and my three siblings, you know, having grown up in, in rural community. And now all of a sudden we're, we're in the city community. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of fitting and a lot of problems, <laughs> um, with us adapting. Um, but I, I spent my, uh, my youth and, and my, uh, the first 45 years of my life, um, you know, on, on the farm and then in Tampa. Um, moved away, lost my job in 2018, um, and uh, couldn't couldn't find a replacement. And that, that's always kind of stung me a little bit because it's, it's not like I, I wasn't without a pretty good resume at that point. <clears throat> Push came to shove, and uh, we ended up having to relocate. We, my family and I, um, had to relocate up here to Illinois where, where my partner's parents lived. Um, and we had, we had to lean and, you know, we landed, landed on them for a little while for some support to get us back on our feet. Um, and it was, it was one of the most life changing events I've ever had. I would, I would have never, um, gotten to, to where I'm at right now speaking to you without all of that crazy chain of events taking place. And there, there's a whole lot of what you and I know to not be coincidences along the way, um, that, that led to this and that led to, you know, crossing paths with Willie and, uh, you know, getting the opportunity and the invitation to, to come and have a conversation with you guys. You know, you know that uh, you you mentioned that you had to go land on some support from other people. But through these struggles, you know, I know for those who, who may not even believe, but it have you tap in to a lot of, not yourself, yep. but tap into there must be a higher power. And I would tell you that until November of just last year, um, I, I would have disagreed with you, you know, and, and that's, I think that's part of the journey that, that we'll get to, um, you know, that got me to that point where I, I finally took a step back and I was like, whoa, let me, let me rephrase it, I guess, or, or give a little context. Um, I, I'm a, uh, I'm a very, very analytical person. You know, I, I use my brain to process everything. And I look around at this world and the chaos that, that has always existed in this world. And it, it's hard to find faith that there's something else, right? 
Yes. Because all you got to do is look around. You, you, you just see the, the, the terror and the pain that's everywhere. And the hate, even by the people that profess to, like, you should never hate. That's, some, that's where some of the greatest hate comes from. And, and it's always forced me to shun the fact that there could be anything more. Now, I'm so analytical that I, I never go to the extremes unless I know. Like, I know one plus one is two. I'll give you that 100%. But I don't know what I don't know. And I, I've never been able to, and I can't exclude what I don't know. So I've always left a sliver of an opening there. Like if by chance I ever got the opportunity to, to have a miracle happen in front of me or something like that, you know, then, then maybe I would open myself up to it. And I, I don't know how to skip around and I don't want to get completely to, you know, to that part of the story yet, but it, it took 49 plus years, um, and I'm, I'm turning 50 this year, but it was November of last year. So I was 49 when I, it finally hit me and, and the impact of just the, the presence of a higher power throughout my entire life settled in and, and, and it was stunning. And at, that was only four months ago, five months ago. Um, so my journey is, you know, in faith is, is really just starting. Well, um, like literally just starting. And, and, you know, and, you know, it's saying that it's never too late to be able to. You know, late is no longer here in existence and, and recognizing what, what is faith. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and this is something that's lacking among a lot of people. Yep. They got faith in what they see. But faith is not the definition of faith. Absolutely not. <laughs> but it's the, it's the things of unseen. The I didn't thing. understand that. And I would have sat, I would have been one here six months ago. I'd have been arguing with you. I'd have been on the <laughs> other side of the spectrum telling you how how it, it, it's preposterous to live your life by faith and to not strategically plan every single thing that you're ever going to do. And then when those, but when those things fail, then that, that brings up more failure and then you eat that failure and then that lives inside of you, you know, forever. But I, six months ago, uh, that was my perspective. There was 0. 0.0001 chance that, that there was anything further than the chaos and madness of this world. And that, that was what I truly believed in my heart. Again, I never closed it off and, I, and I'm thankful I'm thankful to, you know, to God and, and, and you know, whomever for and my parents, you know, my parents did. Let me take a step back a little bit um, and try to tell a little bit of the story. Okay. So get the career part of, out of the way. Um, I was a terrible kid, terrible, terrible kid growing up. Um, I, I did some rotten, rotten things and, and uh, never got caught. Now I've never hurt anybody or, or hurt anything, you know, like that, but I, I was, I was off the rails, um, and flew through adolescence and, and young adulthood just being chaotic and crazy. And, and this is all going to be part of the bigger picture. I don't want to bog our conversation down with, with those granular details, but, um, just say a little bit of yeah, anything because. you want to talk about, Jeff, like, man, feel free, man, like, feel free. Don't, don't hold yourself back because no. at this point. I mean, I'm pretty sure our listeners want to know exactly what's going on. So <laughs> anything you want to say, just go ahead and say it. Well, all right. Let me, I'll give you a couple examples of, of just the, the, the younger growing up. Um, at, uh, so this would have been in the summer of 87. I was 13 years old. I was a huge Beastie Boys fan. Okay. Right. I like Beastie Boys. Love me the Beastie Boys. Um, my parents hated them, partly just because they had Beast in the, the word. You know, my parents were very religious yeah, or had been raised very religious, and anything that says identifies as a beast oh. is a is a you know that takes them to revelations, right? Like, oh, beast! You know, <laughs> go ahead. I wanted to say, man, that is important. That is that your parents was religion. You see, your mom was spiritual and religion. Well, so, wasn't they were they were raised in religion. That's that's all. They ran away from religion when they went to Florida. Because they, they ran away from their family who was doing the same thing. I've, I've spent my life, because my parents eventually found religion again, and I've spent my life running away from them for that same reason that they ran away to Michigan. And I've pieced all that together now. So this goes to say, I don't care if you just around it. It's going to get in you. You can't. You cannot deny it. You're going to know about it. You're going to be like, oh, I'm, I'm, oh no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to believe this. But in, in, in a way, if you hear it, one time. It's always there. It's always there. They still say we only use such a small portion of our brain. What do you yes. think? What do you think the rest of that is? Well, you know, what's crazy is that people sometimes they say 
you know, they say, okay, well, I don't believe in this and I don't believe in God or I don't believe in that and certain things, right? But then they believe in destiny or they believe in faith or they believe in um, things happen for a reason. You get what I'm saying? Like you could take the belief on things that don't exist in the world, like physically, but then you say, hey, you don't believe in God. And they say God and they say, we don't believe in God. It doesn't make sense that you can believe in all these other things, you know, the way the mind thinks and everything like that, but yet you can't believe in, in God. Well, and I think Greg touched on an important point. You said the word religion, and I might have brought it up, religion. I think that's part of the problem. Religion religion is part of the problem. Yes. The I would vast, agree too. The vast majority of our world identifies as a religion or or as a particular faith rather than finding Spirit. finding their own spiritual relationship yes. with a higher power yes. and then manifesting that. However, if that means you go to church and you share it, then, then that's fine. If that means you stay home every week, if that means you take nature walks and, and you worship that way, I, I, religion to me is the core root of the problem of our world because the, the volume of hate that comes out of Christianity nowadays, Islam nowadays, the Jewish faith nowadays, I mean, it is, it, it, it had, it's it everywhere. Bled, it had bled into everything. See, exactly. instead of being spiritual and understand that your spiritual journey, it's a lot different than your religion journey. And, and here's the problem. I, I think the masses, instead of putting in that effort to find themselves and, and start that spiritual journey on their own between them and a higher power, whatever you, whatever you define that higher, higher power to be, they're, they're skipping that difficult, tough process, and they think just going to church, any church, whatever they identify with, that's that's the, the answer. And that isn't the answer because religion is there to, to feed you guilt and shame because they need you to come back. They need you to follow the rules. They need you to be strict. And it's, you know, it's rules, rules, rules. Got to do this, got to do that. You find spiritual faith. You don't have to live by rule. You don't, you live now. You If you're always doing the right thing and if you're always processing, you know, what's going on, and you're you're not making decisions based out of your head, but you're making every decision based out of your heart. It's a different world, man. Completely different world. And you suddenly identify where a lot of that negativity and hate's coming from, and it's coming right from the same place that's supposed to be the solution. Yeah, I think a lot of things are interpretation too, because you got to think like this: you can get a you can read something right, and you the way it's written, and you interpret it one way, and somebody else can interpret it that same reading a whole different way. And the thing is, is that you gravitate towards who's interpreting the message the way you want to hear the message, if that makes any sense. Like a lot of times I'm listening to something, I'm like, oh, man, this man, you ever went to church, he said, he's reading the Bible, and it, you were like, oh, man, this has something to do with me. They're talking about me right now. You know what I'm saying? And somebody else is saying, hey, they're talking about my life. But your, your lives are talking about, you have two different things going on in life, but yet every person in there or just about everybody can relate to the situation because it's being interpreted in a way that they can understand it that, that works for their life. Do you know what, though? I, that's, that's, you bring up a very, very important and interesting point. See, God made us to be for one purpose, for him, really, truly. So you can interpret it a different way but it, we, that's how we all connect. A message can connect to you, can connect can you to connect. That's that instant connection. The same thing right now. When God put it on the person's mind and heart to create the internet, do you know what? See that see, that was a godly thing to be able to connect. Yep. And that's what it happens. His but, message. But we we take some we take those things and we twist and you know, and, and now you look at social media today and the impact and you look at AI and the fear. Now you just open the newspaper or, or scan the headlines. I mean, everybody's so afraid of AI now it's going to take us all over. You know, we're all going to be slaves and <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy that the, the amount of fear going around the world on AI right now. Um, anyway, I, Willie on, on your interpretation, I, I think you're dead on, but I think there's one and it doesn't matter what faith you have. I, I think the, the faith is, is irrelevant to the message. It, it just, ha it's the message that's most, if you, if it takes Jesus to find the message, if it takes, you know, Buddha, you know, whatever, as, as long as you get to that, that place of understanding, I, I think that's important, but to interpret. And, and I think we're all of the Christian faith. Um, Jesus simplified it very, they, they tried to trick him up and they tried to challenge. And I don't know the Bible. I literally just started reading the Bible three months ago. I didn't even own a Bible until three months ago. I just bought a Bible at a thrift shop. But you, you got that desire, but I, I have that desire. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Jesus said there's only two things. They tried to trick him up and get him to put his foot in his mouth. If you love God and you love your neighbors, that's it. That, yeah. that, is, that is Christianity. So if you are in a Christian faith that hates LGBTQ or hates uh, you know, other countries or other faiths, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said there's only two commandments. If you love God and you love your neighbors, then there is no hate in your heart. So if you can look at yourself and, and you right now, whether it's an, an ex or whether it's your former company, it doesn't matter what the scenario, if there's an ounce of hate in your heart, you're not living. And you can simplify the entire Bible down to that challenge where they challenge him, what, are, what is the most important commandment? And he said, love God, love your neighbors. If you're loving your neighbors, there's no reason for you to be hoarding guns and you're not living by faith. That's true. Because why? If you're living by faith, you don't need that gun. If you're loving your neighbor, you don't need to be ready to put six in somebody at the drop of a hat. I, I'm like this. I, I, on some level, I, I completely agree with you, what you were saying before, but it's a saying that you don't need to have, you know, a gun because you don't, for less love or it's less love for your neighbor if you have one. I don't think that's the reality. I think the thing is, is that the message is like this. Like if we say it's interpretation. So for one person, they're hearing the message this way and they're doing, and they're, they're going by it, but other people aren't. There's always going to be someone who's not. You, you're right. You get what I'm There's going to be levels of, so, of that faith. So that and being the lower said, level of faith is still grabbing on to, hey, I got to defend myself. I, I think you have to <laughs> because in a, in a world that we live in with chaos. You don't and, have to. I think well, in the you chaos know my, that we have. My house just got shot up on Easter. You know that. Yeah. I, yeah. I own a pink baseball bat. That's it. That's I've never shot a gun. So you're trying to get your I've Matthew never shot McConaughey a gun. on. No, I'm, I'm not. not. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't trying to do that. Like, I'm, I'm saying just, I live in faith. Well, see, my brother, my brother, a few years back was shot and killed inside his house. You know, I'm he was shot in the head. You know, and I'm not trying to put that on anybody else and say, hey, you know, this is this is why you should or shouldn't do anything like that. But like the level of protection I want to have for myself and for my household and be able to protect my family, I want to make sure that I have something available to myself. When somebody comes knocking at the door and I'm and I answer, you know, yeah. I want to be able to answer that door and know for a fact that hey, there's a you know a chance, a fifty percent chance that I'm gonna I'm gonna still be living when the situation ends. You know, if uh, somebody comes in the house and kicks down my door and they come in with a gun, I want to have a chance to be able to grab mine or be able to defend myself in a way that I can stop whatever's about to happen to happen. So like that's why only I'm, I'm the only thing I'm saying about that is that me personally. I understand, like the the of protecting yourself because not everybody else thinks the way you think. Well, we get- absolutely, and and I, I wasn't trying to try, trying to judge on that at all because you're right. It's all where you're at on your own journey of spiritual faith, and, and I I think I lean more towards when when the Romans were coming to grab Jesus up, you know, sure. and and Peter took out the sword and attacked one of them, you know, cut his ear off, and Jesus yeah. is like, live by the sword, die by the sword, brother, and then fix the guy's ear and send him on his way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and when you, and I think that was the message that Jesus was trying, if, if we could spread the message to where we don't all have, and that's never going to defend you from the, but from the bad guys. But when you can get to a point where you're living of that faith, you don't feel the need to, and like I said, my house just got shot up four or five days ago. I'm not changing my seat. It was right above where I sit. I'll show you when, when we go back later today, I'm, and I made it very, very known to the the people that I have a suspicion about, and and to the authorities when it was reported. I'll be sitting right here next time. Aim lower. <laughs> aim aim six inches lower, and I'll be right here. But was you thinking that they was intending to shoot your house up? Yeah, but I, I that's not something. There, there's legal stuff on that now, and I'm bringing it up as an example of of living of faith um, rather than living of fear. I think um, like, so like having, having and, and Willie, you have every right yeah. no, knowing you lost different. your brother yeah. to gun violence. You know, I, I have, I haven't lost my brother to gun violence, so I haven't been in those shoes and you, you have a perspective that I've never, I, I know a lot of perspectives in life because I've been in a lot of different shoes and a lot of different roles and a lot of different scenarios. And we'll get back to my 13 year old beastie boys thing in a minute. Um, <laughs> but that's a perspective I don't have. And, and so I can't share that. Now I'm going to learn that perspective yeah, for sure. by getting to know you better and understanding your journey and, and how that's impacted you. And that's important to me. Yeah. And that's why I say like, it's, it's like one of those things, like I don't, I don't live by it, but I want to have it. 
You know what I mean? And I, I get that. I just want to have it. It's like having groceries. Exactly. exactly. You know, you don't want to have to go out and buy every meal. You, you plan in advance. You have meals in advance. Exactly. You know, I, I get that. You know, so I think I feel like I feel like, you know, when we talk about like having, you know, weaponry or having guns or anything like that, I think there is a set there is an excessive excessiveness of some people with with weapons that they do have. You know, what I mean, like I, like the whole point of like the shootings that happen with the schools and stuff like that and having assault rifles. Like what kind of world are we living in that we need to have assault rifles? You know, what I mean. Like, somebody's going to judge me and say, hey, you know what, like, we need to have this because what if martial law comes into play and we need to defend ourselves and stuff like that, you know, and that's, and that, and that's very true. That could happen at some point in life. You know, we, could, we never expected to live out through a situation where we would have COVID and have people wearing masks. We didn't even know how long that, that situation was going to last. We thought that was going to be an ongoing situation for years to come, you know, and to live through a, a pandem- uh, pandemic like that. So, like... Uh, the whole situation with, you know, having these uh, rifles and different guns and artillery, like how much stuff do you actually need? I don't think, I don't, in my, I don't think in the next 10 years we're going to have a situation that, that goes like that, but I can't predict the future. But at the same time, if that's the case, then why is it so accessible for children to be able to get that in their hand though? That's the, that's the problem I have. It's not the problem that you want to have that. You want to have all the artillery, you want to have bombs, you want to have grenades, whatever the case may be. I'm gonna say bombs, but you know what I'm saying, grenades, whatever the case may be. But like, why is it accessible enough that children can go get it and go shoot up a school and you know do this or do that to other people? It just doesn't make sense to me. To me, that that's the responsibility of the owner of the weapon. It's like your responsibility is to to make sure nobody else can get access to this. And if it, they do, that you report it immediately so that it's known that it's out there. You get what I'm saying? See, like, here, here's the difference. You're living on faith of people that they're all going to do the right things. That, that's right. And, and, and it, when you start living Ooh. in that philosophy, hey, man, life's going to spiral. Yeah. Because the people aren't, people aren't going to make the right decisions. They not. People are not going to be, but so if we were going to, a, if we were going into law, I would say that's the one that they should focus on. You know, I, I think that it should, it's not a day. It's not a day. See, you know, Nothing has ever been moved by the masses. And when well, they things get moved by the masses all yeah. the time in oh. the wrong direction. In the wrong always direction. in the wrong. The masses are <laughs> always wrong. Always. Yes. If you're going with the masses, you're you're going in the, the wrong, wrong direction. Way. Now, to start something, it don't take a group of people all the time. It take one and two, one and two to spark this thing to go in the right direction. See, let me give an example. Okay, Jeff and, and Will. If we wanted to really, truly, truly make a difference, this is what I think this station is going to do, is make a difference. I say, if you got three people, the three people's in this room, if we say, hey, you know what, thing? we're going to take these three people, we're going to host a meeting. This meeting is going to consist of three more other people. These three other people believe the same way that we believe, and we're going to go down each and every neighborhood right now. We're going to give them something because we know it's a reward type of um, culture we're in anyway. You're going to get this reward. You know what a good reward would do to get people involved with you? Say, hey, man, you're going to qualify for a grant to fix your house up. Come on, man. People are going to need a place to live all the time. If you be a part of this and you do this and you do that, this can move. People will be lining up. And be accountable because they are getting something. See, this is what the society do. Society make the poor and the rich. They sure do. And pit them against each other. And put them against each other. And when you put them against each other, you're going to have chaos. And now it's even gone further because with social media and, and how we can see everybody's lives around us. It's also created us against each other. It does. So it's now it's no longer the, the poor versus the rich. You know, or the the rich taking advantage of the poor in every way that they could possibly imagine. Now you got the poor jealous of the poor next door, so they're fighting, and, and you got the rich jealous of their. You know, and you see that with all of our celebrity gossip and bullshit all the time, and they're all fighting. You know, and and what was just a us versus them is now a us versus everybody. You know, and and that that manifests in the chaos in our world. In the world, in the way I lived and grew up, you know, because I grew up in the inner city of Chicago, so. Um, the way I grew up, it was always that way to me. Like, it never seemed any different. It was always the poor against the poor because, like, it was like 
It was the haves against the have nots. And at the end of, end of the day, it didn't matter if you was rich or not rich. If you have it and I don't have it and I want it and I know the only way I can get it is going that direction. A lot of people choose that direction to go after it. You know, it's not like, um, you know, when we when I grew up in Chicago, I lived in uh, like on 59th in Princeton. I mean, if anybody's familiar with Chicago, that was mm-hmm. the Inglewood area. Mm-hmm. Um, one of probably the worst areas you can live in. And and the people who live there probably won't say that, you know, being, but like anybody else who heard, who watched the news or anything like that would say, Hey, yeah, Inglewood is like a really tough area to, to grow up in. Um, a lot of things happen to people because of, you know, no organization or lack of jobs, you know, lack of, uh, what's the word? Um, opportunity, uh, opportunity, education, yeah. you know, these lack of that's, these things that's that the biggest lack. problem in our world is yeah. the, the lack of opportunity or the lack of the the instillment into the the younger generations that you don't need to wait for the opportunity to come to you it's already in you it's you already, already in you, you. just got to find it truth it's Bro, already in you preach on man with the preach on he, he delivering easter eggs right now i'm <laughs> right telling you boy now. i'm telling you <laughs> it's, it's in it's, you it's in you man it's the thing is this is one thing I do like about social media, and I'm not going to say I like everything about social media, but one thing I do like is because it can take the lowest of the lows and show them that there's opportunity outside of the everyday life that they're living. Because the thing is, like, these people who were out in the street corner selling drugs are now making TikTok videos and, you know, Facebook videos and YouTube videos and getting views and making money. Now, there is some negative parts of that too you've seen people who got killed on 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 the, one of those one of those uh social media platforms you've seen things that people getting robbed and stuff on those social media platforms but you also see a lot of the of the opposite i see more of a the positive side than do i see than i see the negative as i used to like in life it was a lot of negative i seen where i grew up at it was a lot of negativity that goes on but now you can see you can see a lot of good things that come out of it as well. And I think that sometimes we don't acknowledge what comes out of social media that is actually good for people. Cause now people are now making a lifestyle of, Hey, I'm going to go out there and make these videos and make money instead of going out on the street corners and selling drugs. Yeah. You know, just presenting an opportunity for the opportunity. Yeah. You see That's a good saying? way to put it. Yeah. You know, it's just like this, man. Like well, if you close, if you close yourself off to the opportunity truth, for an opportunity truth, to ever come, then you're, you're, you know, you are going to go down the path that Willie's describing. The truth, a- absolutely, and that's the reason why one goal of mine is to be able to go into the school and give every kid an opportunity to come in here and speak on his mic. That would be amazing, Greg. <laughs> the stories you would hear, boy. The yeah. stories you would hear, but the lives you would touch, the because, lives because they would, touch. they would feel heard. They yes. would they would feel just even if it's just for a moment, they would feel heard and, and their perspective on life would be different than the one that they're stuck in that they can't sh- shake free from. And they don't know how to shake free from because there's no opportunity. There's no opportunity. So, they don't have the skills that you have. They haven't experienced the people that you have experienced. Exactly. So they don't even have anything else to bounce it off of. And that's our job at, as in, in our yes. generation is yes. to instill that downward mm-hmm. on them. And so I, I agree wholeheartedly well, with that. You gotta, you gotta look and say who's listening to them. That's the, that's the thing too. That's the other a thing. Yeah, you're right. like, they have ideas, they have these concerns, general concerns, and no one's listening. The, the thing I love about, well, and that creates a vacuum because then the guy, you know, the people with the bad intentions see that vacuum and they're like, I'll step in here. I'll listen to them. And next thing you know, now they're going down the bad. They're they're going down that road. other path because they were never given that opportunity to be heard by somebody who actually cared. That's true. You know, um, it's a lot of things like where if people were to listen, and I think I like this. Is what I was going to say, I, I think I like the way. The only thing I do like about what's happening now and th- nowadays is that um, the younger generation is stepping up more and saying things that needed to be said years ago that people were too afraid to say and too afraid to do. And then making changes that, like, we didn't have before. You know what I mean? Like, they step up and they say, hey, we see this as being wrong. We're going to do this. Now, don't get me wrong. Back in, like, you know, the 60s, stuff like that, there were a lot of things that happened that people were stepping up and doing a lot of things at that time. But what I'm saying is that we got so used to this idea of being free that people thought that, hey, I'm living in a, in a free place now. And they just went on with their lives and not got involved in a lot of things that are way deeper. And the younger generation are saying, hey, you know what? We want to be able to have 
you know, lesbian, gay people, whoever the case may be, run for office or be in the military or do these type of things that well, at first we were holding people back from growing in life because of, you know, stigmas of what we, what we felt was going to happen if these people were in these type of fields and stuff like that. And now it's like the world is changing because of the younger generation. But you know what, though? I, 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 this is my opinion. I think that people would who on the in their community and who they are, I'm not knocking who they are, but I think that a lot of people choose to go that direction because it's easy. Because it's easy. It's true. It's easy. That's that's the simple answer. And they to feel it. it gives them more opportunity. You see what I'm saying? And so I think that if you shine the light on opportunity, like coming in here, man, come in here and speak. What you, what you got, Shorty? What you been thinking about? What's your dreams? What do you want to be? What do you just want to have fun in doing? What do you want to do for your family? Right. And, you, and, and frame it completely positively positive. so that they walk away. They got a link to that forever. They can share yes. it. And, and then they live that. It they wasn't just it. a conversation. Now they have a reminder of their own words and the own po- their own positivity that they, you know, espoused in the conversation and it's there forever, and that that's part of the beauty of social media. That's the part. That's the yeah. that's the that's the the whole that's, love. That's the connection. The connection that we're searching for. Right. You see what I'm saying? Because you know, uh, I know that when you can look to a, a a young person and you can just talk and say something to him, and he just look at you like you know that he's trying to resonate a thought in his mind. You know that he he taking what you said and putting it up against to what he thought. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So and if so, and it makes sense to him, it will become taller than a giant. But if it doesn't, but if it doesn't, it goes on the scrap heap, and then it's it's harder. I, it becomes harder and harder and harder and harder every time they hear that message. Throw it right on the scrap heap. That's real. That's that's. That's that's that real. That's real. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So we as as people who have responsibility, because you know what? If you wasn't on the microphone here today, you know what I'm saying? You you wouldn't have a greater response. I mean, a less of a responsibility. But since you came and, and got on the microphone today, your responsibility is higher. Yeah. What is required of you is higher than anyone else's that didn't come on the mic. That's true. That's true. So, so Jeff, like, what's what's like your educational background? Like, where's where's that? Well, let me let me finish that uh, 1987 Beastie Boys. That kind of okay. leads into my. I want to know. I want to know this. Um, so, I was a huge Beastie Boys fan. Um, I was already off the rails um, by the time I was at this age. Um, my cousin and I were sneaking out on the weekends, and we'd roll shopping carts out into the road, you know, just to watch cars hit it and get out and be like, <laughs> "What was that?" You know, this was in the middle of the night. Um, I, we were we were rotten kids. Kids. Um, huge Beastie Boys fan. Um, I ended up with two tickets. You know, I went down to Specs Music and got my own tickets. You know, um, couldn't couldn't wait for the day to come. Never really thought about how I was going to get there. It was over in St. Pete Bayfront Center, been blown up now. Um, but it was forty forty five miles from my house. I'm thirteen. Like, how am I how am I going to get over there? My parents think sure ain't going to take me over there. Um, I ended up hopping the city bus out of Brandon to Tampa, Tampa. Crossed the bridge over to Pinellas County and about five more buses to figure out how to get to, the, you know, this is at 13 years old. And I get there and I realize I got no money. Like, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. <laughs> you you must have been 13 years old because you went someplace without no money. I, I had no money in my pocket, not not a penny. And I don't think I'd even thought about it. Now, I'm, I'm skipping ahead to the story. I'm, you know, I, well, let me, let me not. Um, but we'll, get, we'll get to that in, in a little bit because there's, there's a reason I got to that point and I didn't realize, you know, um, but... Anyway, so I'm over in St. Pete. I've got two tickets, though. My cousin, you know, he, he didn't have the courage to, to break away and skip school. And this was an all-day journey. I did skip school, hop the bus at 9 o'clock in the morning so I could figure out how to get to the concert by 8 o'clock at night. And I knew, I, you know, I had 11 hours to figure it out. I, if I had to walk, I could walk it in 11 hours. That was, that was my plan. Um, and I'd spent, you know, what few dollars I had on, on the bus to get over there and uh, had one extra ticket in my pocket. So now at this point, I want a T-shirt. You know, I don't want to go to a concert without a T-shirt. And I'd never even been to a concert before. Well, I, my, my parents, you know, brought me to a whole lot of country concerts and stuff growing up. And, and I look back fondly on that stuff now. I hated it back then. You know, we hated, you know, me and my siblings hated country music. 
because it was what my parents liked. We, we liked what we liked and it wasn't country. <laughs> um, so I had this extra ticket I go up to the, uh, the t-shirt guy. I ended up working a trade with him for a t-shirt and a joint. Now I've never smoked weed. I didn't even know what a joint was. <laughs> um, and I ended up trading that for liquid for a drink. I traded that with a, a vendor. I was like, Hey, I don't know what this is, but I'll take a Coke. <laughs> um, Concert's great. Get through the concert. It was uh, Murphy's Law, Fishbone, two punk rock bands that I had never been introduced to, and I didn't really know much about punk rock. And I thought it was weird that they were opening up for the Beastie Boys. Now, in retrospect, the Beastie Boys started off as a punk rock band in New York City in the early 80s. So, it, you know, just natural crossing of paths. Anyway, great concert. Get out. I think it's 11, 1130. Now, my parents have no idea. I didn't. I never came home from school. They didn't know I wasn't at school <laughs> in the first place. Now, I'm... I, to this day, I don't, you know, I don't know if they got their phones blown up. I had no money. Buses are already shut down. It's 1130. Whoa. I know. And I'm 45 miles from home, 13 years old in, in St. Pete. Mm. Like I, I put myself in my parents' shoes today. Like if this is, you know, and I've got a 14 and 15 year old at home, I, I would be devastated. I don't know what I would do in today's world. Now that it's not like that world was much better. Um, anyway, I flagged down a cab. I gave him my address I had no idea how I was going to pay for it. I knew my parents were going to be pissed when we got there, and 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 they were. Um, my dad paid that taxi bill, but boy, did I get in some trouble. Mm. Now that was leading into the summer of '87, and I was still I, I I turned 14 now on the backside of that summer in late August. That got me thrown away back to Michigan. You know, like he's off the rails. Let's send him up to the farm, go live with grandma and grandpa for you know for the summer. Um, and we're, remember, we're only talking about this story because you guys wanted some of the, the chaos of my childhood and, you know, some of the things I did. We, we just want the real, the real, because you know what? That's all people, I am is real. I don't Real, man. People don't understand. People always try to play, play, uh, dress it up and do whatever, whatever. You know, I just feel like, hey, come, 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 come all the way. Greg, my life is an open book and it's, it's going to be a much more open book. You know, that I, I envision we'll probably have several conversations oh, like this. For going. sure. Um, so anyway, I got, I got sent away to Michigan to live with my grandparents. And uh, I spent that summer stealing their car every single night at 13 years old. Oh, pause. Yeah, at 13 years old. Go ahead. 13 years old. Stole their car all summer long. I, I would say it was probably 40, 50 times that summer. So the first couple of weeks there, I learned their sleeping patterns. Learned when they're going down. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're elderly at this time. They're, I think they were in their 60s or so. Um, and they had a very regular routine schedule. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so they're going down every night and every night I'm, I'm popping grandpa's car and, and going and picking up two cousins and away we go. Yeah. Spent the whole summer doing that. Now I, the two cousins, one was a little younger. One was a couple of years older. They were too scared to drive. So I was always the driver at 13 years. And we're this, we're not talking dirt roads. Now it is a dirt road community. We were driving 35 miles away to Mount Pleasant, the college town where central Michigan university is at. So we could cruise the strip like all the college kids did at the, you know, we were really trying to, but you got a 13 year old behind the, the wheel of this car all summer long, all summer long. <laughs> one, one night we put it in a ditch and the three of us, it was two 13 year olds and a, and a 15 year old somehow got that sucker out of the ditch. I have no idea to this day how we did that, but we got it parked back and, and grandpa never knew anything, never knew anything. Um, but those are two, you know, that was just a, a one summer of my childhood growing up. <laughs> so, well, fast forward, um, I, I got lucky enough to finally fall in love, you know, or I thought at, at, at 16 and, and, uh, became a young dad. Um, and that responsibility truly set me on a, a path away from the destructive. So the original question, Willie, was my education. Um, I didn't have much. I was, I was a wild child all through high school. Um, I barely graduated the, my senior year, I had to do summer school. You know, I walked with my class, but I had to do summer school to pick up another couple of credits just to be able to qualify to actually get my real diploma. Um, and in, in that summer school, one of, one of the classes was, uh, I don't remember what the actual class was, but I remember we had Macintosh computers and I be, I fell in love with, with the computers back then. And it got to the point where class would get over, school would get over. And this was night school. I would like hide in the bathroom so I could stay in the school. Yeah. And then I would go up. It was this kind of ceiling. I'd go up through the ceiling and back down into the Mac room so I could play computers. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I, and Do the I, breakfast club all over. <laughs> I, I, I did that all summer long for that, you know, but 
I learned a lot on computers and now, you know, it, it fed into eventually my IT career that that's been very successful. Um, so I barely graduated high school. I cheated to do it, you know, because part of going up through that roof was learning things that I, I wasn't, I didn't know enough. I needed more, you know, it wasn't just to play games. It was getting ready for the next class because I was, I was a little bit slow in, in some of that stuff. It took a while to, to, to learn a lot of that. So I barely, I, I cheated to graduate high school. By the time I graduate, you know, I've, I graduated in June and I had my, my child in August of that year, um, or my first child. So, I, you know, it's not like I'm heading off to college with, with my resume mm-hmm. <laughs> ain't, ain't no college is looking for me at that point, unless, you know, it's a car stealing college, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> um, so I, I settled down and, and my dad is one of the hardest working people that I've ever known. Uh, my entire life growing up, he worked seven days a week, seven days a week, seven days a week. The only time he ever took off was for summer vacations. We'd go up for two weeks at summer vacation. I'm sure he took a few days off with mom here and there that I, I don't recall, but he's seven days a week. Always said, now he ran his own construction company. It was a block mason concrete. Um, and that, did, did that, did that challenge you in any type of way or like, was that beneficial to you in, in any way? One of the, I have a tremendously high work ethic. Um, and I attribute a hundred percent of that to my dad. Mm. And, and if you just look at the, the, the DNA, knowing that his dad and his dad's dad and his dad's dad, and I've, I've traced that line all the way back to the 1400s in England, all farmers. Mm. Now there's an occasional military guy that gets plucked out and you get a, you know, corporal Peter hunt or, you know, whatever, or, but all farmers. And if, if you know anything about farming, there's no nine to five Monday through Friday. Those, mm. those guys are working seven days a week. Yeah. Um, now they're trying to fit in a day off. You know, a lot, a lot of them live by the Bible principles and they want to observe a Sabbath. And, you know, so though, and I think that was the the family that I grew up in, um, except for when my dad shunned the religion and ran away to Florida. He didn't care about that Sabbath. It was seven days a week. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have three brothers and sisters. Okay. An older brother, uh, about two and a half years older. An older sister's about a year and, and a couple months older. And a younger sister who's a year and change younger. We're all would very you, close though. Would you say that work ethic went across the board to everyone or is it just like specific ones It went through like, you don't have to like divulge the, completely into it. It's the, just like war. the desire for that work ethic is, is instilled in all of them. But I don't think any of them got the glimpse of what my father instilled in me. Exactly. They got yeah. it from an outside perspective. I, even when I was off the rails, I couldn't wait to work with my dad on the weekends because I got money mm. and he paid me well and I worked my ass off. And I, you know, I loved slinging blocks and I eventually, by the time I was 17, I could lay block, you know, I could lay block. It's, you know, not quite as well as my dad. My dad's one of the fastest block layers I've ever seen. Um, but I could pour concrete. I, you know, I could do all that stuff by 17. I was, I was a fully skilled Mason. That worked out it. Now my dad and my mom was business owners as well. Will's dad is a business owner. Work ethics. See, now, this is the deal. You took it on, a high-energy thing to be able to just achieve whatever you you put your mind to. Now, you got other brothers and sisters. Now, that same effort didn't go all the way to every last one of them. But it's, it's in you, though. Absolutely. It's in them. Yep. They just don't... They just don't recognize it and the same, and my, the my, same. my and sister, go towards that light. Yeah, both my sisters in particular are, are two of the most loving, fascinating human beings I know. Um, and, and they have, they've, I don't want to say struggle, but they've really found it difficult in life to find their place in, in, in to be able to utilize, you know, the, the things that I know and I see inside of them. And, and they found themselves in life situations periodically or, or sometimes in long term, And I'm, I'm not saying I haven't either. I mean, I, my, my private life has been just as much chaos as what I just described from 13 through 17. It's pretty much been that my whole life until, until the last year and a half when my mom passed. Um, and. But think, every, but every time you was inching towards that. Absolutely. You was inching towards that. See, then now that you, you know, found, so this faith, which God has always blessed upon you and you was able to recognize it didn't take much for you to realize and say, 
dog. This can happen and this can happen. And you didn't take no time to believe, not believe. You said, oh, man, this happened, bro. Yep. This happened. And so you went all again like you did, all for it, into it, and believed that it happened. And so now the change is, is a fear has dropped to the wayside. Yep. All of this is dropping to the wayside. All yeah, and, fear. and we'll, we'll get into that. Willie and I talked a little bit about that on the way here. Um, and I, I think I've got some profound experiences i think that that he said in particular that, that you would you would like to exchange on get through the the education and the the upbringing real quick and then i think we can start segueing over into that part of the story um so i was working with my dad you know at this point i'm a teenage dad barely graduated of course i'm going right into the same career as dad i, I start laying blocks and um you know that that became my career for a little while got the opportunity to uh Walmart distribution center was opening up, you know, and this was back in the day when, when they only had 14, 15 of them around the country. And suddenly here, Brooksville, Florida is getting a wall. You know, it was a big deal, you know, 1.2 million square feet and going to, you know, hundreds and hundreds and it might even been thousands of jobs. I don't remember. Um, anyway, I, I applied there, you know, to, to be an unloader. I figured I'd go unload some trucks. And that, that's where I started my actual career outside of working, working for my dad. I got hired to be an unloader at 665 an hour in uh, 1992 um, and spent four years there. I worked my way up to, I was, uh, I'd, I'd moved around at this point. Uh, I became supervisor of unloading and then went to supervisor of like the, the forklift drivers, you know, worked my way up into, into management pretty quickly, even though I was a young kid. Obviously I had talents and I had skills that I had always ignored because I was too off the rails to tap into them. Well, Walmart instilled a lot of, and I, and I give them a lot of credit going back. Um, they, they really helped helped me understand a little bit about who I was then. Now, again, I'm, I'm still off the rails. I'm a good dad, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not living the values that I look backward upon now and wish I could have lived and raised all my children with, yeah. um, because they'd all be different, you know, they'd all be different people right now, For sure. but that's, that's living in regret. And I don't do that anymore. Um, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. And this is, yeah, I see you smiling. I like, I like what he says. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> like I got something in store for you guys. <laughs> so Walmart was, was a, a, a big, a big deal in my life. Um, and I spent four years there. I transferred up to New York, uh, Utica, New York, Rome, Utica, and helped them open up that warehouse as, as a supervisor in, in the areas that I had become an expert in. Um, and then ended up transferring back to Florida and that, that career kind of fell apart. Um, but it led into the opportunity now I'm in my young twenties, 23. And at this point I'm a single dad, you know, my, uh, my partner and I had, or my wife and I had, had gotten a divorce. Um, I still had the kids. So I'm, I'm living that side of the, the world. I'm a single dad. And I'm, now I just became unemployed. Um, so that was, that was kind of difficult. And then I, I realized that I was kind of getting a calling for a higher education. So I, you know, I, I started looking into it. Um, Next thing you know, I'm at Hillsborough Community College taking some classes. Um, and they had a single, they, they had just started a single father program. They already had a single mom's program, but at this point, we're talking 1996, 97. And single dads were becoming a little more prevalent in society. And uh, I tapped into their first single dads program, which helped me financially, you know, get three semesters of college under. Um, I did very well in college. Now, I graduated w without... And I, I'm sure I'm using some slang and not not speaking, you know, completely proper. Not that I know proper English, you know, thoroughly. But I graduated high school without hardly any language skills. I mean, I other side of the tracks in in Zephyr Hills is basically <laughs> was my upbringing there, and I had no interest in school. There were several classes in school that I my chemistry teacher let me completely quit, go into his office every day, kick my feet up, read the paper walk across the street to the circle K and get him a coffee while I was getting me some, you know, that's what I did for 50 minutes every day. Um, my Spanish teacher did the same thing. I don't want to learn Spanish. Fine. Go sit in the back and read your paper. Just don't, don't disturb me and leave me alone. Those are things that I look back on now that, you know, that, that's adult, that that's somebody screaming for help. You know, that, that was me screaming for help for, for somebody to step in and say, why, why aren't you interested in learning any of this? You know, I, I just didn't want to, I, I couldn't. When I hit something that was too challenging that I knew I was going to struggle with, I, I just, I wouldn't do it. So that I'm in college now, but things are starting to click. Now I like trigonometry, just, just, geometry, all this stuff that I had no idea about that I would have never thought that I could. And, and I'm embracing this stuff and I'm like, wow. But you know what I couldn't embrace was speech. 
and I signed up for speech class for three different semesters. And three times I went into speech class in that first class and they're going around the horn. I always sit in the back, you know, Willie knows me enough now to know I'm, I'm, I'm hiding in the shadows. <laughs> um, and three times they're going around the room because the first speech class, it's always, Hey, introduce yourself and tell us two interesting or three interesting, you know, I could not do that. I, I it, as it was approaching me three times, I, I couldn't race to the drop ad line fast enough to drop that shit and, and move on because <laughs> I wanted no part of it. And after the third time I, I quit because I realized I was never, I was never going to move beyond that. Yeah. Um, and that, that has been my life. Like sitting here now talking to you guys, you know, being out in public and singing a little bit like I have with Willie. Those are things that don't, those were not planned in my plan for life. It wasn't until I let go of my plan for life. Oh. And yeah, there you oh, <laughs> and your boy can sing. Your boy can sing. He's he's multi-talented. I um he came to karaoke one day and I was out there and this is how we met. I was out there and then I heard him sing a song and I was like, "Man, this guy is really good." I was like, "I'm going to go say, you know, man, great job, you know, cuz like I feel like when you in karaoke or something like that or you doing anything that's great, people Sometimes need encouragement, you know, so to continue going. Um, he hadn't he hadn't really come out like that. He was just basically like, you know, showing up to karaoke, singing here and there. And I seen him sing. I heard him for the first time sing a song, and I was like, I got to say something to this guy. Let him know he's doing a good job. And since then, I've been running into him at different karaoke spots. And he's like, man, I I appreciate the encouragement, man. Like I didn't for a long time. I never sung before. I never sung in public like this before. So like. It made him feel good that people were coming to him and saying, "Hey, man, good job. We like what you're doing." You know, so I mean, that's how we end up meeting and being coming like really cool. But I just, you know, just to bounce off the same thing, Jeff. That's how good God is. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. And I've how, only scratched the surface. Good, <laughs> that's only how good God is. That one thing can lead to another, and how that you don't know what you don't know. Yep. But he knows what you don't, don't know. know. Yep. And it's, it's, it goes to show. And as you was continued, uh, you know, because what you say is it's so important right now. Your journey is so important to a lot of people because they feel that same way. Go well, on, Jim. And, and, and that's, that's really the only reason that I'm even here. Yeah. Because as, as I've explained to you guys, this is not about me. I, I don't. I, I've lived my life. I have a good career. I, this is nothing about me. My mom put me on a journey, and and maybe now's an, an opportunity to skip ahead. Um, you know, I, I think I ended with uh, college. I quit college. Um, I landed into a, a call center job in IT. At, by this point, fast forward, you know, since I had been hopping the the white ceiling in school to learn the max, um, you know, I, I owned my own Packard Bell, and, and I, I became pretty proficient on early Windows and Windows ninety five, and you know. I, I was installing Windows 95 for friends. I had no training, but I, it was a passion. And my life takes me down roads of passion. Once I find a passion in something, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going on that. Well, right now my passion is sharing my, sharing my journey so other people can hear it and, and learn from it because my life has been chaos. Yet I find myself sitting here right now with, with two fine gentlemen talking about the things that I, I, I wanted to share. And I, I was struggling with figuring out how to get, get the opportunity to even speak it. And, and it's not like I came to you guys, you know, yeah. Willie came to me and said, Hey, come, come out and talk to me. Um, so anyway, I, I, I land in a call center job, IT call center. I'm instantly, I'm really good at that. And I, I really, I, even though I, I don't like people, I, I've not been a people person <laughs> my whole life. Well, you can fool me. No, I mean, well, this is a different me now. You got to understand I'm talking about at this point, 24, 25 year old me, D different, different time frame. I don't like people. I, I, I've never liked people. Um, it just, it, people are just weird or, or maybe I've always been the weird one and, and everybody else is, you know, I just, I've just never been much of a people person. That's not to say I've been a, a loner. I've, I've been very successful in my business career because somehow, you know, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde, you know, the, the, I, I can set it all aside and I can mask well enough. It's a switch you can turn on and turn yeah. off when you need to. Now, I, I've never been able to quite control my tongue. I've dropped way too many <laughs> F-bombs in front of important people that I'm just now starting to, and you know, I still drop it out every once in a while, but I'm really starting to try to rein my tongue in a little bit because I've, I've, I've had a bad mouth my whole life. Um, 
And that's probably one of the biggest challenges I've had in this journey is figuring out how to, because you turn people off a lot of times and I'm sure, hopefully I haven't turned any listeners off by dropping a, some here that, well, at some point, you know, hey. my, my family could be listening to this at some point and, and I wouldn't be surprised if they get offended at, at some of the, you know, the, the words that I've used. The thing used. is that like, that's the thing about a podcast of speaking openly and freely. Like people are, so there's going to always be somebody who doesn't like what you do. You know, no, no matter what you say, That's you can life. say, you can say, I love this. I love this and say, love, love, love everything. And everybody's like, this guy loves everything. He's just too much. You get what I'm saying? Like, yep. there's no matter what you do, somebody's going to have something to say. So just say it anyway. Yep. No, I, I hear you. Um, so I land in this, uh, this call center job that works my way up into the big five. And by the big five at the time, I mean the accounting firms. So I'm, I'm providing phone support for Ernst and Young. Um, one of the, the, now it's the big four because as, as anybody who knows the industry knows, Arthur Anderson went away in, in the two thousands and the big mm -hmm. five became the big four. Um, so I'm working at Ernst and Young that segues into an opportunity to, pro to get a job doing hands-on, you know, in it next door at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, the other, or one of the other big accounting firms. And that started a, a very, very successful career of mine. You know, I spent 14 years at PwC. I, I, PricewaterhouseCoopers made me as much of the person that I am now um, as just about anything outside of the discovery of faith. Um, I got so much training and continual, like how to deal with change, how, how to, how to handle the, you know, highly emotional situations, which I, I'm a highly emotional person. Um, as in, I'm sure anybody in my family, you know, I'm sure my dad could attest to right now. Um, you know, it's, there, there's, been quite a few emotional reaction situations throughout life that could have went very, very differently. And, and, and I look back on, you know, and, and thank, thank God he was, he had his hand on those situations and, and helped to, to manage through them because I could have been gone a long time. You, you sure could, it could have been gone when a person shot your house up. Yeah. That was, just, and, that was just more recently. He talking about like in the past though. Like I'm just, just saying though, in the past also kind of like pan forward the future guy got his hand over you. Yeah. Well, and it's just showing, and and that's that's probably a good segue. Um, just tell a few. the The average American has three to four car accidents in their their lifetime, and that's that's insurance statistics. That's not totaling cars. That's just you know that's a minor fender bender. I totaled a car, and I got you know two other accidents. Got broadsided, you know whatever. The statistically, the average American has three to four car accidents in their lifetime. Through two thousand and ten or from 2010 through 2014, I totaled, totaled nine vehicles. And I walked away from every single one of them without a scratch, except for coincidentally, one of them in which my partner and I, to this day, we'll, we'll say we got, you know, we got drugged. We were, we were out at, uh, at a club uh, to watch my buddy, who's the lead singer of a band. We had one drink and we were both about to fall over. Um, and we were like, we got to get out of here. We, and we, we never even heard of first. I think it was the first song when we, when we left out to the car, um, we fell asleep in the car. I mean, we, we could barely make it to the car. I remember that part of it. Oh, she was drugged. The keys were in my pocket. I had a leather jacket on and the keys were in my pocket and we went to sleep. And four hours later, we woke up to flames around the entire, our car was on fire. Um, and, I, I remember opening her door because we were both panicked at this point. I remember pushing her out and then I get out and I, I saw that it wasn't our car yet, that it was on fire. It was all the grass around it. So like a dumbass, I go running back, trying to kick all the grass, you know, trying to kick all the leaves and stuff out. And uh, next thing you know, I'm on fire. <laughs> so I, I've got wow. third degree burns up and down my, my right leg from, from that incident. But of those, and that car, it exploded. Um, as soon as I caught on fire and got about, I don't know, five, five, ten steps away from it, boom, it was like a movie. Um, and there, there's pictures and, you know, insurance claims, all, everything I say, oh, there's, like there's nightmare, man. every single thing I, I say on this, there's, there's validation and documentation um, to support it. So I'm, no, not, I'm not, I'm not making any of this. When you on this channel, we on this station, we believe what you're saying, man. We yep. listening to everything you're saying. This is your story. So yep. you only, you're going to tell it the way it, it actually happened, you know? So. I, the point of telling the details of that one incident was that ironically, you know, I had totaled nine vehicles without a scratch. And the only one that I got any kind of injury on was the one where my stupidity ran back 
thinking that I was going to be some kind of Superman and save my car. Like, oh, why am I care about my car? Now, I should have been more interested in being grateful that I, holy, some somebody woke us up or something woke us up and got us out of there in a nick of time because there's there in all likelihood, we probably should have both went up in flames that night. Had we been sitting in that car 10 seconds later when it exploded, I mean, we would have been killed instantly. And, and there's no, no debating that. Um, my mom always said, because it seems like every time I totaled one of the vehicles, it was always my parents that had to come pick me up, even though I'm a grown ass man at this point. And every single time my mom would pull up and she said, Jeffrey, God has a plan for you. And I was like, no, no, he doesn't look at this. Is that his plan? Well, man, I don't like that plan. And it just, it pushed me further down that path of rejection. Even it, it's silly to look back on now because I miss my mom. I wish I could have this conversation with her now because she knows she always knew that was just that one period. It's not like I don't have other car accidents. Now I haven't had any since, you know, since I, I had a moment of realization in 2014 that, um, that something was wrong <laughs> and, uh, when, I've never had another accident since. Um, but the, the, just some, inc, you know, a few incidents of how, where I look back now. You understand that God was with you all the time. 100%. And I rejected that. My mom was always trying to get me to see that. Like immediately in the aftermath of the chaos, my destroyed vehicle right there. I just went 100 miles an hour straight on into another tree. Like how many times are you going to do this, Jeff? You went, you went 100 miles into a tree. I went 75 miles per hour into a brick wall. Hmm. That was just one of mine. I've, I've hit brick walls. I've hit trees. I've hit signs. I've hit every, but every one of them are head on, usually head on. at a high speed. High speed. But they had to cut us out the car. So your journey and my journey got some of the same elements. Elements. See, that the, that the thing is, is that when people look at a situation, it, it's a good and a bad of that situation, right? The good thing is that you walked away from it. The bad part of it is what happened. And they look at it and say, well, God couldn't have been with me with this because look at what happened to me. And that was always my perspective. They only see the one side of that situation. They see the like the left side of that. Hey, this is the bad that happened, blah, blah, blah. But the right side of that was saying, hey, you walked away from this. Who got you out of this? And that's where, that's that decision that people have in their head and they, they have a hard time trying to, trying to deal with and understanding that, hey, don't always look at the negative at that of why did that happen? You know, God should have protected me. God should have looked after me. You know, you were driving this way or under this influence sometimes, and this is what happened, but God pulled you through it. And that's the time, that's what people have to see and acknowledge as well. That is that, hey, the greater part of that is you're able to walk out of this alive. You know, I think that at those moments, everybody is at that crossroad. You see, when you... When you walked away, you didn't want to believe that God had nothing to do with this. But God did. See, God knew your heart, though. Yeah, because he looked at it as luck. He looked at it as luck. You see? And God already said, oh, man, you know, you know, walk away. But see, your mom knew. She did. Your mom always knew that God had his hand on you and that you was going to do something special, not only for you, but for everybody else to be able to benefit from your journey. And everybody, I believe that right there before death, crossing over. When that, when it came to me, I said, my, I know my God not going to let me die like this. This is what I said out loud. I know my God is not going to let me die like this. And, and that was a form of prayer. You know, that was you speaking to God. Like, you know, is, you know, is this how it's going to end? <laughs> I, I, I knew it. He, he, <laughs> right, I knew exactly. It. I knew it wasn't going to end like right. that. I knew if anything could have happened, I could have just moved my arms and I would have just made the car stretch. And I, I had that much faith. That's awesome. It's because you knew your purpose hasn't ha hadn't happened yet. I knew that my purpose hadn't taken place. And that's part of the problem is I live my life without a purpose. My whole purpose since I was a, a teenager was to raise children and make money to raise children and, and try to try to do the best job I could. And I, I've raised fantastic kids. I, I, I don't want to do the math in my head real quick, but it's somewhere around 130 some odd years of parenting. And so far, you know, no, no arrests, no, no, no bad, you know, kids. N nobody's been in cuffs that I know of. I do have four adult children now. <laughs> so uh, that opportunity is always there. But I, I'd like to, even throughout my own life's chaos, I like to believe that I instilled enough values and, and raised my children um, with, with enough. And, and sometimes it, 
the end result certainly wasn't a product of the style of de the message delivery because I've been, a, I'm a football coach and that's how I got part of my voice was, was yelling and screaming. And, <laughs> um, I'm so, a football coach. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, his purpose, you say he never really had a purpose. He may have had a purpose the whole entire time and not realize what he had that purpose. That's real. So like, for example, he said, you know, I was take care of my kids. I was trying to get them on the right path, put them in the right direction. Right. And that was his kids. Now he's saying in life, he's trying to tell his story, get a story out there to maybe help other people. Maybe his purpose is to help people. You get what I'm saying? It started with the kids. First, maybe even started with himself, helping himself to realize, hey, yeah. I need to be better for myself and then for my child. And then now helping his kids to understand things now to help other people amongst life. So like his journey is just is to help probably. I mean, his purpose is to help save people. Get people out of the, out of the negativity that he was going through, and tell, by telling his story, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, and turning yourself inside out. See, you realize this at a later age. What are you trying? Maybe that they they having the same doubt, they having the same uh, process. They probably be going through the same thing, and you already got the answer for them, and you're just trying to give them the answer, like you said, cheat. Yeah. Well, and that's a good segue. Let's let's yeah. let's that's segue sure. up. Um, into again, how we're here. So chaotic life. Um, my parents and I have, uh, have spent the life, my entire life, button heads. And I was the only one of my siblings that always seemed to kind of go in the other direction. Um, even though I, I can't tell you the countless times I've had to crawl back, back on my hands and knees asking for help. Um, and that's, unfortunately that's, that's part of life. And I, I look back and I thank God that they were always there and they never, they never said, nope because they, they probably should have with as much as we butted heads and went in opposite directions, but that's not who my mom was. Um, so anyway, fast forward up to the pandemic and, and that changed everybody's lives. Um, suddenly we were all living in a world that we couldn't have even thought was about to, to land on us. And at this point I've, I've run away from my parents again, you know, from 2018 I'm in Florida and that's, that's where I had been for, you know, so they're close to my kids we're able to go over to Sunday breakfasts, but we still try to, I try to keep that, that distance with my parents. And it's, it's a lot based on philosophical or political views. You know, we find my majority of my family's on one side and I don't want to say I'm on the other side, but if there's a side that, that involves heavy judgment or, or that criticality of, of, you know, just, I don't, I want to say hate because I don't want to go that far, but just that, that, you can't do that. You can, yeah, oh, it's terrible. You know, to me, that's a reflection of not having done your own homework yet. And it's easy. It's easier to, to look outwards and hate than it is to look inward and hate yourself mm -hmm. and, and where you've, where you've failed and where you've, you know, so anyway, uh, early 21, mind you, I've been here for three years now. Um, I don't, I'd seen my parents one time since I moved up here, they were at a, a family reunion in Michigan that we were able to go up and spend a couple of days with them at. So that was the last time I got to see my mom. That would have been summer of 20. Um, and then in early 21, I'm, I'm driving to work at this point, my employers um, over in Champaign, Urbana, and I'm in Bloomington. So I'm, I'm driving 45, 50 miles to work every day. And we don't even talk on the phone very often because it, there's just usually so much judgment involved. And I, I just, I avoid that stuff and I, I've avoided it my whole life. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be in the presence of other people who are all just judgy, judgy, judgy. You know, it's, I, I just don't like it. Um, and looking back retrospectively, that's, that's, it's a quality that I think is actually pretty good um, and has allowed me to not necessarily follow the masses because usually the masses, they, they, that's how they get together is in the groups of judgment. And then they, they form a, you know, a group of judgment becomes a tribe of judgment and, and and, you know, again, going back to our conversation about religion, that, that's what we have now are tribes of judgment. Well, see, the crazy thing is, is that when people get to groups like that, they all are in groups in, in, in regards to a one particular aspect of what they're judging. But if you actually break down more situations with them, there's a lot of things that they don't agree on as well. Right. You see what I'm saying? But they, they found one they common bond enemy. over enemy. one common commonality. Exactly. And, and, and yeah. Yeah. So this really, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get on that, that tangent. Um, that's a conversation for another time. But so anyway, we don't have a great relationship is what I'm saying. I talked to my mom. She calls me, it's probably March or April of 
2021. And uh, she had found out that I could sing fairly well. And she'd probably always known it. You know, you can hear your kids singing, you know, in the shower or whatever. She'd probably always known it. We'd never talked about it. It was not in my personality or character to ever, ever, ever sit in front of one of these. Um, I've been deathly afraid of, of a microphone my entire life. Um, no karaoke, no singing, no speech, no nothing. Now at Walmart and at PwC, I kind of came out of those shells a little bit in that with team environments, sometimes you had to communicate. You know, sometimes I had to give presentations at PwC to a, like a group of, we're in a training and there's 20, 25 people there. And, and you know, you work, you're at a workshop and you spend three days and the, the, cul, you know, the culmination of the three days is you can, now you'd have a little presentation or whatever. So I was able to figure out and gut through some of those things. And I was terrible at, it. I was always the worst, worst in any of those scenarios. Um, so my mom, she's just like, Hey, Jeff, sing to me. <laughs> like You are crazy. Out of, no, out of, nowhere. Out of nowhere. She's like, sing me a song. And she actually asked for a specific song. She must have heard you singing somewhere like along in the house, well, know, humming something or the, so the story behind it. And, and there's a YouTube link that, uh, that I can share with you. You guys okay. can, you can integrate it into the pie. Is what sure. I was telling you about. Um, well, fast forward a little bit, but there's a link to what I'm about to describe that you can go back and watch. Um, so anyway, she says, sing to me. And I was like, no way in hell, mom. Not now, not today, not ever. <laughs> and you, and that, that's pretty much that's pretty much how the kind I can remember saying you are out of you are batshit crazy, mom. There's no way. Um, and I I told her no, and she said, well, promise me that you will someday. And it was easy to make that promise. I went the easy path. Oh, oh, sure, I promise you, mom. Someday I'll I'll sing to you. But now I'm sitting here thinking I got, you know, I got years. You're not looking ahead. I just made a promise, and I'll, I'll I know I'll fulfill it with her someday. I'll get, even if it's just me, you know, and her in a rocking chair or something, I'll figure out how to sing to her. So I said, sure, mom, I promise you I'll sing to you someday. She was dead four months later. She died of COVID in uh, right. se September of 21. And it rocked my world. And it was primarily that promise, you know, and I don't want to say primarily because I, there was a whole lot of factors. The fact that I had not had a great relationship with, with my mom for those last several years, especially since I didn't live there anymore. Um, I mean, it, it, it really wrecked me and, uh, it sent me into a, a period of self-reflection. Um, so one of my sons at the time is really, really struggling with, with, you know, grandma's passing. And so I reached out and got him some therapy. That's not something that is common in my family. We don't, we don't go to therapists and, you know, we, we just, it's, it's like black families. Yeah. I don't do I don't yeah. A lot of black family don't right. do therapy. I just described all the judgment that I don't like. And and there's no quicker way to get in front of a, you know, a, a judge and a jury than to try to tell a doctor what you're going through, or you know, especially a, a head doctor. And so it's just not something I've, I've ever done. Um, and my parents, or yeah, my parents certainly never have, but um, my siblings, I don't, I don't know where they're at, but I, I know at, at the time we were all, you know, pretty close. To, I don't think there was much psychiatric or, or, you know, psychological or any kind of mental health care in our lives. Um, my son needed it though. He was, he was really struggling. So I got him into a therapist and before giving him the opportunity to step in there with his, a lot of the same people issues that I have, where I know he was just going to be a, a brick and not say a word <laughs> by himself because, you know, it's not like you can go in there as a parent. Um, it's for him and the therapist. I, I wanted to spend that first session with his therapist to explain kind of his life context. And so she had a better understanding of him and hopefully could get him out of his shell to talk about it. And by the end of that 45 minutes, she had, you know, without diagnosing me, told me, you, you are off the rails, ADHD. You need to go talk to your doctor. <laughs> um, and then he subsequently, you know, pretty much immediately got diagnosed with ADHD as well. Um, so I did. I, I finally, I, I was seeing a resident at the time. Because again, I think it's looking back now, I think I've always preferred resident care because they're less judgmental than actual doctors. So I like giving the college kids who are still learning or are still acquiring their credentials and are doing it out of their, you know, out of their heart rather than they're a know-it-all doctor who just, you know, da, 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 da. Um, it's your, it was the perception you had. That's what it was. Yeah. So I go to my doctor and he gives me a couple of, of um, things and we spend some time on it. And after a couple of weeks, he's like, yeah, you're pretty off the rails. And, and I start on a, a, a small um, 
medication. Um, now we worked our way through several different medications and, and whatnot. And I'm, I'm on no medications now. Um, that's, that's been gone since July of last year. It was a very short term thing. And that, I think that's an important message for the listeners to hear is that when you do find yourself on that journey and somebody does tell you, you have something and you need to take, you know, do your own homework first. You, you need to understand what it is that, that they're trying to tell you that you have. And, and then you can segue that into a, a period of, of medication to help you get balanced. But I don't think any of that medication is a forever thing. And I, I for me, and here's kind of how my journey went. So I get on this medication. We're talking in, in uh, December of 21 now. So this is a couple months, three months after my mom passed. Um, I'm now discovering, you know, I, I still reflect back on that. I'm able to step up on stage and sing. Oh, I, I don't, I didn't even got to that. So my mom passed. She had two memorials because she was a very loved woman. She had one in Florida and one in Michigan. Um, I tried to honor her promise and sing to her at her Florida memorial. And, and I just couldn't get the courage up. You know, I, I couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, however, there was, I got one more chance now in October and I, uh, I coordinated everything and, and I locked it in. I'm on, the, you know, I'm on the printed, you know, uh, you got to do it now. So it, literally my last chance to honor my mom's promise. Um, so I get through October and, and, or get to the memorial in October and, and I get up on stage and I introduce myself to my family. Uh, there's no way any of you ever could have saw me standing here. Um, and I explained the story that I just explained to you guys. And I sang her a song. And what, what song did you sing her? Uh, Garth Brooks, The Dance. And that was the song she asked me when she called me. She's like, sing me. It's, it's, a, it's a personal um, song that I've, I've taken my mom to see Garth in concert, you know, back in the 90s. It, he, was a, he was a big deal back then. And I took my parents up to Jacksonville. And I got to, sh you know, they were always big Garth fans. I was a pretty big Garth fan. Um, and we got to share that. And, and that's always been a very special song to her, like in particular. I, I can remember that song coming on at times where she just, tears, you know. So it resonated with her in a, in a big way. And that was the song she asked for. And that was the song I sang to her. Now I had never sang to music or anything. So I sang an acapella. I mean, it was very, how did you go? I look back. It wasn't very good, but, but, but as you were singing it right now, what you were singing to her, how would you sing that song to her? Now, hang on. <laughs> Will, Willie knows I'm uh, my, my throat's a little shot, so I'll, I'll give it a shot. Okay. But, uh, um, looking back, on the memory of the dance we shared beneath the stars above. For a moment, all the world was right. How could I have known that you'd ever say goodbye? And I, I'm glad I didn't know the way it all would end. The way it all would go. Our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain, but I'd have had to miss the dance. Yeah, I'm a little, uh, little shaky. Yeah, there, yeah good. Was great, man. <laughs> great. Hey, man, you know, hey, man, it's nothing like a song to touch the heart, especially a song that means so much to I know that song would always mean as much to you you know because it meant it's your it's that your connection to your mom that had with you yeah. and I, I haven't broke it out at karaoke because I'm I don't know if I'll make it through it so it's a rough it's a rough song to sing I can I can understand because it's an emotional song to sing um but man like when you you do an amazing job at it man like what you just did here on the radio I'm, man I felt that yeah me too thank you me too so you know. it, Anyway, honoring her request to get up on stage and sing to her, something that was just never, I would never in a million years have gone down that path. It was not who I was. It was not. So God knew. God knew she had a short amount of time, and, and God instilled upon her to instill that into me, the opportunity for the opportunity. Going back on our comment, you know, mom gave me the opportunity for the opportunity. And, and I grasped onto that opportunity from a promise or for a promise or to honor that promise. And it set me on a completely different path. So now we're in December and, and I bought myself a guitar, you know? Um, so my, my 15 year old, 
very talented guitarist. He had just started a year before. Whoa. Um, again, nobody in our family has ever done anything musically outward. And, and he wanted to learn guitar. So we, I bought him an acoustic guitar for his birthday in 2020. Or no, it was actually 2020. So he had only been playing six months, I think, by the time I bought mine. Um, and I again, I never even touched his. I think I strummed around. I didn't know any chords or anything. I would just like, hmm, oh boy, I like making outward noise now. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas before, I've always been very internalized and, and reserved. Um, so I bought a guitar, just a Yamaha acoustic guitar that is, to this day, one of my best friends. Um, I've only had it, you know, for 14, 15 months. I, actually, when Willie pulled up to pick me up this morning, I was sitting out on the porch playing it. That's where you can find me a lot of my nights, just sitting out there strumming, trying to learn switch chords and you know, trying to teach myself. Um, so I picked up that guitar and I started playing it and I realized right away, you know, I wasn't good, but I, I could hear, you know, I, I could learn the positioning of where to put my fingers to make a chord. And then I could, and I just started practicing transitioning between chords that, that sounded right. So I, I learned seven or eight chords and I spent, you know, quite a while just trying to learn. So in, we're in December of 21 and near Christmas time, again, a couple months off, you know, it's a, it's a rough time. My, my mom had just passed. Um, it wasn't the most festive of holidays, if you will. But my guitar is becoming, it's almost like my best friend through this period. Because when I sling that thing over my shoulder and I start strumming it, and make, everything just gets quiet. And the world just drowns out. Um, now, at the same time, two of my, uh, you know, I, I, I would say closest and and most beloved cousins up in Michigan are, are go through a traumatic experience of their own. Um, one of my favorite and closest cousins is diagnosed with stage three cancer. And, and she's a year and a year and a half older than me. She's the age of my older sister. And, and that, that crushed me. I mean, coming off of my mom and then another cousin father, I mean, a, a mother of 10, um, her husband is the pretty much the sole breadwinner in the family. And uh, he dies of COVID as well. And, and, and now these, these are the family that, that never left, so to speak, the, you know, the farms and the rural communities of Michigan. So their, their existence was, you know, went a different path than mine, <laughs> a lot, lot calmer, I would hope, Jenny and Rondell. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to hear stories about you guys doing craziness that I did. Um, but I mean, if I was, if I was destroyed in October or September, I, I tell you, I was, I was really destroyed when Jenny and Rondell's situations hit. Um, however, this is also at the same time that I'm starting to discover that I actually do have a little bit of talent. There's a music journey somewhere here. And, and I, it just, it popped into me that somehow I can help. I can help them. I don't know how, but somehow I can turn this music into helping them. I don't go to the office. I work out of my basement pretty much all the time. Coincidentally in, in January of 22 now. So we're just you know a little bit over a year from now or ago. Um, there's a need. I live next door to Broman, the, the hospital, and, and I, that's where I work is for that hospital organization. There's a need for me to go in and train a, a guy who had just started in the department that it's not my department, but the guys on the front line install, you know, stuff that all connect into my you know systems. I get to sit in my basement and support all these systems, but well, there's lots of guys on the front line and on the back lines that, that need all the data that come in off these things and then go out off of, you know, but everything runs through the systems that I manage. So I'm, uh, and, and he doesn't know anything, even though I don't touch these pieces of equipment, I have to know them very well in order to support what I, what I support. So there's a need for me to go in and train, train him a little bit on the systems. Um, so I, I go in and, uh, I've been playing guitar so much. I have scabs. I mean, I have, these four fingers are like bloody. And I, I realized then I can type 120 words a minute. I couldn't type my password and I'm sitting there in front of Tyler for I don't, five minutes trying to figure out how to either lay my fingers there and get through the pain enough to figure out what my pass. And I create such complex passwords where, you know, I replace A's with this and that, you know, they're, they're all over the place. Um, I, I did not, once I took my eight fingers off the, I don't know how to type my password. I didn't even know what it was. So it, it took me a solid five minutes to get logged into my own machine to try to teach him about this. And I'm embarrassed. I'm, I embarrass easily. I'm turning red. I'm as red as an apple at this point. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I'm just learning guitar and my fingers are all jacked up and I, I don't know how to type my password. Now, Tyler speaks up and he's like, that's, 
That's wild. You're just learning guitar. I'm a lifelong musician. I quit music at the beginning of the pandemic, and I have hated it since then. I've been anti-music. Whoa. Been anti-music since then. And uh, and I explained a little bit of, of my story, that uh, why I'm trying to so aggressively learn guitar, that I, I, I felt inspired to try to help my cousins who I knew were in need. Um, and, and that was the, that was the fuse that he needed to get relit back in him because then he's, Tyler's like, man, I have an entire music studio. I have dozens of instruments, drums, guitars, bass, all kinds of horns. I, I have recording equipment. I have a full studio. I mean, it's very much like this with instruments everywhere. And it's the basement of his home, but he's such a musician that that that's his love. That's his passion. And at the beginning of the pandemic, he got so angry at life or, or music in general that music was what took the took the back seat. Um, fast forward a little bit, he I explained my journey to him, and he's like, "Hey, come over." I come to find out, he only lives a mile from me. Um, come over, let's let's start jamming. Let, you know, let me let me teach you some of the stuff I've known. You're giving me the motivation to get back into music, and I am at the point where I need his his talents and his you know where he's at. Sure. You can't tell me that was a coincidence. No. And, and to this day, I'll, you'll never be able to convince me that was a coincidence. <laughs> so in uh, February of 22, we started a three-month journey where we were, I don't know, three times a month. I'd go over to his place for a couple hours at night. And most of the time, it was like this. We ended up sitting around talking more than anything and just getting to know each other. Um, got to know Tyler really well and, and, and really love that man. Um, come May, now... What, what we're doing here is, so let me take a step back. We both work at Carl, C-A-R-L-E. Um, now, I have since found out that Carl is a surname. You know, so there's, there's a lot of Carl. It's not like something that they just pulled out of there. And it's an archaic word that's been retired out of the English language for some 500 years. But, but what it really meant, you know, back in the 15, 16, 1700s, back when it was slowly getting, it just meant a regular man a thrifty person, a hard worker. Every definition I've found for the word Carl, C-A-R-L-E, is something that I resonate with, deeply with. So, and we both worked at Carl, and we met at Carl, and we are both just two regular guys. So we created this moniker because I, I would never do any of this for me. I will never, I, I was only interested in doing that for Jenny and Rondell then. Mm -hmm. That's, that was my only passion. And so it ended up, I came up with a moniker that, hey, if, we, if we're going to do anything, and we were talking about actually recording and releasing, and we, we, we were going to go all in on this. I, I will only ever do it under T.J. Carl Jr. That's the name that we'll go, you know, Tyler and Jeff, mm -hmm. Carl, oh. Jenny and Rondell. Mm. And so I created an entire business plan. I have hundreds of web, uh, websites registered, on not with just T.J. Carl, but with things around that, you know. Yeah. Um, I created accounts for all of the, you know, all of the sites that you as a, this is your industry, like the Patreons and all, TJ has all that stuff and it's all just sitting there waiting. Um, what, are you guys, what are you guys waiting on? Well, that's where the story gets. More so, interesting. so we're working towards um, in July of that year, I've got two family reunions coincidentally on both sides, my mom's side and my dad's side. And my goal is to try to come up with some sort of a charity event because these overlapping reunions are there at the same time in the same 20, 30 miles apart from each other, um, come up with some sort of event where we can invite family from both sides to participate in, in my journey a little bit. Sure. Let's sing to you. And there, there are other musicians in my family up in, in Michigan that I was trying to tap into to help out with this. And I'm sure they would have had it came to fruition. But unfortunately in, uh, in July, I mean, in May, as we're working towards this, um, this period in, in July when we were wanting to actually do these charity events, suddenly Tyler's dad passes away. Wow. Wow. And the, the fire that, that he, that I, I gave, that I gave him to get back into music was doused with buckets of water. Um, and the entire thing ended just, you know, in, like in May it was, it was over. Um, so now you can imagine I'm even more de devastated because here I am, I'm at the point where I can actually see the progress, not just in my talents, but in the ability to be able to help my cousins, which is all it was about. I just want, 
And now that rug just got yanked out to me again because of death. Death just, you know. Yeah. So now Tyler quits music all, all completely. We, we've still never hooked back up. And I, I think there we will. Um, I, I fully have faith in that, and I believe that. Um, and we're, know, we're still close. You know, sometimes, though, people are just here for a season. It could be. You know, like, the fact is that you were just getting started on the guitar. You were, like, you know, getting a handle on it, and he already knew it. He knew music. He had a lot of the, the stuff that you didn't have. You learned to work with him. Yeah, a lot of that stuff I still don't have. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to talk with him and work with him on these th- on these things to, for development of yourself. Yep. And like what Greg is saying is like, you know, it could be a season. This is what you needed to then move to the next step. It, it was, it, and it propelled me to the next step. And this is where we're, we're about to segue into what I think Greg's part of the conversation sure. where he's going he's gonna to get fascinated. So Tyler's dad passes away. And, and now Tyler's dad also works at Carl. Okay. And had worked there for 42 years and was very beloved, you know, and, and well-known. Um, and, and unfortunately, Tyler just, you know, I, I propose, hey, let's, let's, let's debut TJ at, at his memorial, you know. Um, let's, let's get up on stage and do, do something. And it just, it, it wasn't enough. I, I, I understand where his heart was because I had just gone through the passing of my mom as well, you know, just not seven, eight months before that. Um, he wasn't able to do it. Music was a shared thing between him and his family and his dad. Um, you know, he used to describe, you know, that that's what they did on their weekends as they got together as a family and did, you know, did jams and played the banjo and played, you know, that was a part of who they were. Just like it was absolutely not a part of who I was, <laughs> you know, it was the polar opposites. And now for him at that point, once his dad was gone, he, he just had to shut it down. He, he was done. Um, I still think, like I said, I, I think there's a chance it's been a while. You know, we're coming up on a year, um, and I think there'll probably be an opportunity to circle back with him. Um, so anyway, now we're in May, and all that positivity that I was building towards in terms of being able to help Jenny and Rondell just came to a complete fell-off-the-cliff crash, and, and I was devastated, way more so than in December when the news of, of you know, Rondell's husband and Jenny's diagnosis. Um, I, it was the most angry period of my life, looking back, was the month of, of June. And I need to explain a little bit about my brain here. I've got a very fast brain, or I historically have, with multiple paths. You know, usually, usually historically, when I was looking at somebody and speaking to them, I was thinking about, you know, other other arguments or and, and there's always a music path. There has been a a lane of music in my brain for as long as I can remember, and I could not shut it off if I wanted to. There was no way to get a song out of my head other than replacing it with another song. That's the only way I could change the, you know, I had to turn on, it's a small, small world, and I can get rid of whatever's in my brain because <laughs> now that becomes <laughs> toxic. The new song in there. Yeah, it becomes toxic. <laughs> but there was no way to shut that off is what I mean. And and I've always described it to, to any of the doctors that I've talked to. Like, I, I, there's five or six of those lanes. One of them is music. One of them is negativity. That's always looking back at me saying, failure, 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 failure. Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? One, you know, two or three of them are are focused on whatever the current topic or conversation is, checking the database, looking back here, look, you know, whatever. Um, Just a fast brain. And uh, I forgot where I was going. It's all right. You're going to have to edit this one out. No, No, it's fine. We're we're going to fix it. Oh, oh, yeah. So that's that's, that's nothing. But like, you know what's so crazy, though? Like, I'm sorry. You know what's so crazy that is that um, when we first started talking about this podcast, like Greg came to me. I was a manager at T-Mobile at the at the time, and uh, a, a mutual like uh, an employee of mine, but somebody who had met Greg had introduced me to Greg and said, "Hey, this is somebody you need to meet. I think you guys are like would like like to work with each other one day or whatever." And we talked about it, and Greg was fascinated about like a lot of stuff that I knew because like um, I'm I consider myself a jack of all trades. I, I know how to do a lot of things, same thing, but I never felt like I did anything that particularly was like the best. I, I couldn't ever pinpoint this is what I should be doing because this is what I do the best. Everything I did, it was almost like equally. To, at least in my brain, it was equally. Um, but And, and um, speaking real, Willie, that, that's that's what they tell you now is ADHD. Yeah. That, that's that's a manifestation of, of ADHD. I, I believe it. I tell people this sometimes. I say, man, I think um, I think I have ADHD. I, when I read about ADHD and how, like, like the things about it in my brain, it's like, damn, this sounds like me. This sounds exactly like me. I've taken tests on it, 
go online and take some of those quick tests. She says, hey, you, you look like you could be a candidate who may have had ADHD. So, like, I truly believe that's that's something that I have instilled in me. But um, the thing is that Greg himself, when we were uh, putting this together, um, we were going to try to release something because we were trying to get something out there. We was like, hey, we need to get some material out there. We haven't done anything. We have been talking about it for a while. And his mom passed. And I was like, hey, Greg, you know, uh, this will probably be the best time for us to, like, try to get something out there, you know, to honor your mom because he wanted to get something out before she passed. But she didn't, he never got an opportunity to do that. And so we attempted, we were going to tr- try to do that. And I talked to him about it. And Greg, just emotionally where he was at at that time, he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready for it. So I can, I can, the reason why I'm segueing into that is because I completely understand, you know, when, you know, your friend, you know, dad passed away, how he felt at that time. Cause Greg felt exactly the same way. Like he just, he just like, Hey, I, I want to do this, but I just can't do this right now. And for a while we stopped, we stopped. We always were t- always talking about the podcast, always having conversations, but we didn't like push forward. And after the word we push forward and this is how we landed to where we're at right now. And like, it's so crazy, like to understand, like sometimes you get knocked down, but like if you get past that, if you don't get back up and keep moving, you will never, you're, fo- you're going to go backwards. Yeah. You're never going to see what's going to, what's coming at the end of that tunnel. Cause like currently at the moment now we're, we got a, a nice little podcast that's going on right here, but we didn't have that before during that time. No. And, and, and just like you said that, you know, God has, and I, and I put God in everything, bro. I don't care. Like some people say, Hey man, I, I listen to R and B rap and I listen to this, this and this. That's cool, bro. But they don't, you, you don't exclude God because God is a part of everything and not giving them recognition, man. It's like a disrespect. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Respect them. Even though you may not like whoever, whoever respect them, you know? And I think that this situation just in a few days, I know Justin just walked into the room there. You know, and we and I was working the bar as a security. And then I met him and I just instantaneously met him. And he just, you know, the personality of who he is and then meet Will and then meet Jeff and all of them with different skill sets. But See, all coming together as all, one. All coming together as one. Man. And you think that's a coincidence? No, nope. <laughs> I don't No. So I remember where I was going when I lost my train of thought there. I, I was describing how angry I was sure, and how my brain worked. And, and there was that music path that I could never, ever in my life turn off, no matter how hard I tried. And I had tried before. Like, I'm so tired of singing this song. How can I get, you know, and literally turning on small world is okay. I'll replace it. That's even better. Than, <laughs> um, I, after this stuff went down with Tyler and his dad and music was suddenly now gone from my life, I got rid of my guitar I didn't get rid of it, but I threw it in the basement. I, I didn't touch it again for months. Um, I didn't pick it up again until I believe it was November. So I've only had it back in my hands. I, I took a five month break from it, um, and I, I learned out. I learned how to turn off that music because I was so pissed off at music. I felt like the one of the one things that has been with me in everything in life was music. I always had music, and suddenly music had just betrayed me in ways that I I couldn't even describe because I was so hell bent on helping Jenny and Rondell and Tyler just landed in front of me and we became very close. And then just as quickly as that happened, it got taken away. And I was so angry. There was a time in life where I used to, I I was a half marathoner. You know, I spent four or five years just running, 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 because I loved being outside. I loved nature. I didn't realize it. I got, I got talked into doing a 5k at PwC and I did that 5k and I was like, Man, it kind of like music. I was like, "Holy shit, I could do that! I like this," and I became a half marathon. I, I I ran for years. That's um, that's funny because uh, Greg, Greg was a track star. I wasn't a track star by any means. I'm I'm in my thirties at this point. I did triathlons. I did the Chicago triathlon. Good for you, man. You know, where you had to swim a, a mile in Lake Michigan, bike twenty six miles, and then run six point three miles. I, I could I could do the running. I'd, I'd do that blindfolded. <laughs> he said, don't put me in that water. <laughs> a funny bike story. I got talked into doing the MS-150 at, at PwC. Um, and that what that was is a 150-mile bike ride from Tampa to Orlando and then wow. Orlando to back. 75 one day, 75 back the next. Um, I had never ridden a bike since my BMX at 13 years old or something. And as I already explained to you, I traded my bike in for stolen cars at 13. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't ride my bike much after that. So I went 20 something years for, you know, without riding a bike and 
these knuckleheads at work talked me into it. Cause at this time I was doing, you know, doing the running thing. So I was in shape and they're like, Oh, you can do this. It's all for charity. Come on. That was the worst period of my life doing the training for that bike. <laughs> I found muscles within my body that I didn't even know existed. No, and I hated didn't. every minute of it, every minute of it. Um, I look back on it very fondly now, but I can, I can remember on day two, I wanted to quit. And there's a short path back where you can cut off 25 miles and take a 50 mile path back. And, and you can bet I took that 50 mile path back. <laughs> so. I thought he was going to say, no, I looked at it. I said, no, I could do this without it. Nope. He said, no. I took that path. I, I have stood by this. I've said this to, you know, quite a few people when sharing that story over the years, um, ever since that if, if you were to try to talk, I would sooner sign up to run 150 miles and I would do it quicker than I'd bike it. But well, maybe not. Cause we got pretty good. We were pretty quick on the bike, but I hated it. I hated uphill. I hated pedaling. I hated, I, I don't want to say hate. Um, cause I don't really hate anything, but I disliked biking in comparison to what I had been doing for years, which is on my feet, enjoying sidewalks and dogs barking and cars. And I've never been a treadmill guy. I can't do a treadmill. I need, I need nature. I need outside. I need, I need wind. I need horns honking. You know, at the time I was running in the city. Um, so anyway, kind of a, a side story on that. That wow. that's where I landed back. I music had just been kicked out of my life. I figured out a way to. Well, what am I going to replace it with? Well, I live right next door to the Constitution Trail in Bloomington, and I started putting in hours and hours and hours on the trail every day to replace what I was so pissed off at music for. And during this time, I don't have music to listen to anymore. Now I'm filling my head with. ADHD podcasts and, and, and just information. I'm, I'm stuffing my brain full of every single perspective I can get on myself, trying to understand myself. And it, it was really, it was the absence of anything else to listen to because all, all I ever listened to was music and the world sucks. I didn't really want to listen to the news. So I'd stuffed my brain full of information on myself. Mm. That that is the first and most important step in the process of finding yourself is looking inward, having somebody tell you, you know, somebody with authority or, or with the credentials to, to guide you in the right direction as to what you, what you might be afflicted with. And then going down that rabbit hole of discovery. And, and that led me on a journey where I started, the more I learned about it, the more I started looking backwards at my life and realizing how much ADHD had led to the impulsivity of some of the things I described to you, like, you know, stealing grandma and grandpa's car every, every doggone night for, you know, 40, 40, 50 days. Um, anyway, it's, it, it all started registering and tying together. And then I, I, I'll, I'll never be able to explain exactly what happened, but I can tell you on July 4th, 2022, and the night before I had just, I just pulled my family out of the family reunions because I wasn't going to be going up there to help. <clears throat> I had sent my sister a, a very emotional message saying, Hey, I can't do it. You know, I'm sorry. And I explained to her, you know, the journey I was on and, and how disappointed I was in myself for not being able to, to help Jenny Rondell. And it was really an angry letter at my parents or my, my dad at the time, because we have just always, it's just, he and I have always just butted heads. And I told her, I told her in that message that I realized that he and I are never going to be on the same page and I'm just done. I'm done with it all. Mm. Done with the family aspect yeah. because I don't, I don't know. I it's woke up, woke up on the 4th of July and it was as if there was a 180 degree perspective change. And I, I, I can't explain it to this day. I, the, the first, the, well, the first thing on 4th of July, a song popped in my head. And it was a song that I loved dearly that, that I eventually sang at uh, a yeah, couple, yeah. couple, no, not at Carrie, a couple weeks later, I sang to my family mm. to try to share this journey that I was on. So on the 4th of July, coincidentally Independence Day, I wake up and, and my perspective on life had completely changed. And, and I can only surmise, obviously, it was the experience that I had gone through. I found talent that I, I was not familiar with. I manifested that talent. Um, if you look at the Maslow's hierarchy, pyramid of hierarchy. Um, there, there's a, I think there's a lot in that. And, and I had a lot of those things checked off, but now all of a sudden I was finding creativity and talent. And now more than anything, I had spent a month learning about myself and it created such a deep period of reflection for me on my life 
and the understanding. And at this time I have zero faith. I'm still at that point zero, 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 one. You know, I don't deny anything and I don't, but there's no faith. Especially look at my life. What just happened? You know, I hear if there's a God, he's drifting a yo-yo down in front of me saying, want to lick psych, you know, and pulling it back, you know, and, and I, I was more angry. There, there's no spirituality at this point. But on July 4th, and I still wouldn't necessarily, I know now it was a very spiritual awakening or, or, or moment in my life, but everything changed. And, and the first thing I remember outside of noticing the music was back in my head was how much I loved my dad because he was exactly like me. Mm. We're the same damn person. And because of that, we bumped heads a lot. We, and, and if you apply that down further to mental health, I realized whatever I was afflicted with, so was he. And then as more I looked around and so was she, and so was he, and so was he. And all of my family, you know, mm-hmm. what, what, what I could observe at the time. I, I, For the I, most part, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it just, everything suddenly started making sense. When you, when you get to an understanding of like, of mental health and what's going on with you, and you could then see the things in other people too. Like over time, when you like realize, hey, this happened to me because of this, or this is why I was acting this way, or this is why I couldn't understand or comprehend certain things or aspects of my life, couldn't get a grasp on them, and then you understand that, then, and then you, if you if you're open to understanding that other people are going through the same situation, that was it. Once that happens, it's an enlightenment. You're like, oh man, this person wasn't doing me wrong. This person wasn't trying to do this or do that. It was just they were going through these mental challenges themselves at this time. So I'm not using mental health as an excuse for everything, but what I'm saying is that you have a better, better clearer understanding when you accept mental health. It, it, you just hit on the key word. It's acceptance. And, and there's, I think there's three or four important phases to it. And, and the first is acceptance of yourself. You, you've, and you can't accept what you don't know. Sure. If you're just letting somebody else give you a word and now you just describe yourself as that word. Oh, they say I'm this. Well, that's great, but you need to know what that means. Mm-hmm. And and until you participate in that journey to find out exactly what it is, so you you have an understanding of whether they're valid, because only you know you, or whether they're off base a little bit, it, it becomes a little bit of a you know, a struggle. Yeah. You really have to go down that journey. So this all this is fourth of July. I woke up and and if you guys recall, there was the mass shooting in Chicago later that day. Mm-hmm. And it Again, I, I'm on a yo-yo here. I wake up with new eyes. People describe this as, I've heard people describe it. Hey, I got a pair of glasses and suddenly, I, you know, I had bad eyesight my whole life and I put on glasses and now I have 20, 20 minutes. Yeah, I can see everything now. It's nothing like that. This was nothing like that. I call complete bullshit on, on that. <laughs> this was, I literally lived my entire life with no eyes. Well, Jeff, glasses do make you see though. I, I get it, but I'm, I'm t- all, here's the point though. Like, I don't believe in those if you're glasses. not, if you're not looking at the right things from the right perspective, all those glasses are going to do is magnify Absolutely. those, those improper perspectives. Absolutely. That's true. That is true. So that's true. give me that one. So that's why I call bullshit on that, <laughs> that analogy for what I experienced, sure. what I experienced, I woke up and I'd never had eyes. My eyes were simply a reflection of everybody else's eyes because that's, that's all I ever did. I surrounded myself with the opinions and the people and what, whatever I thought. And if things got too hard or too harsh, I'd, I'd move away from that. I'd get them out of my, you know, my parents are a good example. When things got too judgmental, I'd step away from it. I'd go to another state, another war, another job, another whatever. Um, and it, so it was very different. I, I was literally God crafted a brand new pair of eyeballs and put them in because the entire world was seen from a different perspective. And, and it, it, it was one of the most incredible moments of my life was, was that aha moment, that awakening. Um, and that not three hours later, there's the mass shooting in Chicago at the, uh, at the parade. And just as quickly and as excited as I was, I, I was devastated again. I'm like, is this ever going to stop ever? Yeah. And that fire that I had for, for Jenny and Rondell at that point shifted into something bigger because at this point now I've got a pretty good understanding of my journey. And like that, that boy that shot all those, that was me at 15 with access to a gun or something, or, you know, that, that's, that's so many, it's everywhere. 
and, and that that was the inspiration or the moment where I realized that I I wanted to go down this path of trying to share my message, um, and I don't even know really what my message is, just my story, yeah, of of hope, redemption. I I, I don't know. I think that's what it is. Um, of the op- and and maybe this is part of my redemption is is the need to to share it with others to provide that hope for, for others. It is. It is. It's just like, it's like the radio station. Like we feel like the same thing about the podcast here is that uh, we're on a journey to basically put more information out there and hear people's story to help elevate other people and help them decide and figure out their ways and through life, you know? So like we like always appreciate when somebody comes on and like gives this story and, and sometimes they don't see what like, like we were talking about purpose earlier. They don't see what the purpose is. But this podcast of being on this podcast is the purpose. It's is the, the purpose. purpose. Absolutely. Is the purpose. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Every last one of us in here took a different path to being here. But we're yeah. all here. Yeah. But we all here. And we're all on the same page and we're all heading in the same direction. Absolutely. 100%. See, that's that's what's the importance of having a platform like this is because of the fact that we can all come from different backgrounds, um, different uh, cultures, ethnicities, and still have these conversations and all un- have a clearer understanding about things in life, whether it be mental health or um, whether it be about, like, finances, whether it be about, you know, social understanding, like anything, basically, you know. And I'm glad that we have this platform to do that because uh, there's a lot of people who need some direction, and that's why we created the podcast in the first place. And I, I commend you guys fully for it. I like I said, I, there's there's no coincidence that you and I cross paths, Willie. No, no coincidence at all. And and, and 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 plus, God know that we need a lot of help. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> and uh, and most definitely, your skill set most definitely is going to be able to. Uh, oh yeah, I, you I, know, I, propel. Us I'm yours. To, I, to, anything you guys want, I'm, I'm. I've got a pretty done. Uh, like a uh, like Willie <laughs> described, I, I am a uh, jack of all trades, but master of none. Nothing. <laughs> but that means I, I can I can drill down, you know, four fifths of the way into just about anything. If you want to bring up a topic and throw it out there, I, I can intelligently talk about it until it gets down to the very granular. And a lot of times you don't need to know that granular. Yeah. That, there's people that specialize in that. You you can be the one to help because somebody's got to see the bigger picture. Somebody's got to be able to piece all these because people who are very granular, they're granular for life in that. That becomes, that's who they are. People like Willie and I, we have a pretty rounded, robust skill set because 100%. we have gone down so many, so many different, different paths. paths and topics yeah. and, and passions yeah. that we eventually grow out of or we hit a stumbling block where we just can't get any further. Exactly. And we're like, okay, well, I'm pretty satisfied with like that. Like I did enough. I think I did enough where it feels like, okay, I feel satisfied with what I did with this. Absolutely. And maybe I'll come back around to it at a later date. Like I've done that so many times where I start a project and it gets really good and really good. And I get to a point where I'm, I'm at a plateau and I can't get past that, that little blockage. And once I get there, I say, well, I think I'm satisfied with what I, what I did for right now. I'll come back around to it at some point in life. And a lot of times I do like the whole point of me being able to do a podcast. I started off doing music recording. I was doing recording music and making songs and writing songs and stuff like that. And I'm back behind a microphone now, you know, doing some of the stuff that we were doing then, you know what I'm saying? Still setting up equipment. I DJ too, you know what I'm saying? So think about that. Like all this stuff is coming full circle back around to experiences that I had in life. Now that is, it's time to be on a fast pace. Now you graduated from, from the little Tata driving around with yeah. a go-kart <laughs> to going to the track Indy 500 and going, yeah. you know, 200 miles per hour. Yeah. It's, it's time now that, you know, this is the time, this is the season for it to be done. Yeah. When you find, when you find your actual purpose. Yes. That's, that's when you get moved into the, the Indy car. Yes. This, this is, this is, this is the purpose. Yep. The, the purpose is going to be many bodies sits down in these seats. Oh yeah. And there's going to be many purposes that people change is going to be broken. And lives are going to be changed. And life's going to be changed. Jeff, we appreciate you so much, man. Yes. Appreciate you for coming on the on the podcast. You don't even know. A lot of people needed to hear more about the ADHD. People needed to hear about, you know, your journey, things that happened to you, how you had little faith to now gain in faith over time. Like this is things that like that needed to be said out there. And I think that a lot of people out there are gonna take the the message here and say, Hey, there's it's never too late. Yeah. And and again, that's I think that's part part of my journey 
is to make sure people understand that or for me to do my best to at least contribute to that conversation. And, and we're probably getting ready to wrap up here soon. I want to get to the one thing that you and I talked about on the way, on the way here that I think, I think Greg wants to hear about as well. Um, part of this journey. So that was in July now, um, is, is where we're at there. Fourth of July, I had the aha moment and then the, the mass shooting. Several events throughout that month um, led me up to, in August, I started down a really, really, really deep path of, of research. And now, again, I work at a, at a healthcare organization where I've got access to like medical research that the general public doesn't even necessarily have because you, you have to have accounts, you have to have provider accounts in order to get, you know, like ResearchGate, if you want to get an account to that, you have to come from a medical provider. So they kind of, in a lot of ways, they kind of shelter a lot of the information that's out there and available for people to research if they wanted to behind paywalls. Um, so I was able to get behind some of those paywalls because of my position. Now I'm IT, I'm not healthcare, but I still have access to it because I have, you know, my email address affiliates me with that. Um, so I, I ended up going through 192, um, I downloaded 192 different research um things on autism is is where I landed. There's way more than ADHD. Um, And by the time this is done, you know, there's a spectrum for autism. And I, I, if if this is a dartboard, you know, (laughs) I've got darts everywhere on, you know, I'm dyslexic, dyspraxic, OCD. um, You know, I've I've got the ADHD, virtually anything on the spectrum that, that exists. And and I have a huge uh, document, you know, with all of the different qualities and experiences throughout life that, that, explain and, and support, you know, the findings that I, that I went through. And I'm not saying this is any, anything's medically, but again, it's about finding yourself, you know, sure. because if you're waiting on somebody to sit across the table and tell you about you in, in a five or 10 minute interaction, rather than you investing the time. And for me, it was a three month journey. I read thousands of pages on mental health research and I learned a lot. And that kind of led into another aha moment. And part of that process is in order to learn, in order to match up my lifelong experiences against all of these definitions, I had to reflect on my entire life. Like virtually everything I've ever been through, I analyzed and put in into perspective there. And that led me to a pretty profound place of discovery. And, and I was explaining this to Willie on the way over here. I no longer, well, let me make it not about me, our world virtually all the people who are causing problems, and I don't want to say causing problems, but are afflicted with the state of the world and however that manifests for them, experience anxiety, fear, depression, or anger. Those, those are, you know, and, and all of those can manifest in different medical terms, but there's, re- there's really two in each direction. You know, you got anxiety and fear, and then you have depression and anger. And, going through that process of looking at my life and then matching it up and, and essentially forgiving myself for all of the wild things that I had done, because I could now I could draw direct lines to, Oh, you did this because of that. Now, if you had just known this, then you wouldn't have done that. But you you know, you mentioned a a great point. Forgive yourself. That's the, it's Mm -hmm. a, it's such an important, you have to forgive you. You will never find your way on the journey unless you go backwards and you forgive yourself. And then now the next step of that is there's going to be a lot of those situations that you analyze where you realize you wronged other people. And and there's no way to get past reaching out to them or giving them the opportunity somehow to apologize and say, hey, I was an asshole. I'm so sorry. I didn't understand who I was. And you don't necessarily even have to make, because some people get turned off just by the mention of God, right? You know that. You don't even have to make it about God. And I didn't, I was not spiritual then. I didn't know anything about any of this. This wasn't spiritual. It wasn't God related to me. This was, I I was walking through, again, I found out retrospectively, I'm very slow sometimes. (laughs) I didn't realize it was a spiritual journey that I had to forgive myself first. I got up on a stage on on, uh, July 26th and presented to my family um, a a three-hour testimony about my, what I thought at the time was just ADHD because I hadn't even gone down the autism pop, you know, whole yet. Um, and basically asked for forgiveness for everybody in my family who wanted to attend. And it wasn't a huge audience, but you know, there was a, a, a posting of kind of a text version of what I was trying to get out there on Facebook. And I, I did my best to 
for for those who I have wronged, I I am sorry. And here's, what made you come to that conclusion to to draw to July fourth? When I woke up on July fourth, I'm telling you, it, it started resonating then because I'd already been doing a lot of analysis on myself through that whole ADHD podcast phase in June. You know, I'd already been like, really, that's what that was. So I'd already been doing a lot of that in my head while I was out walking, you know, forgiving myself or understanding myself. And that July 4th, I think, was the forgiveness of myself. I finally reached a point where I, I forgave myself for who I was or who I thought I had been and realized that that wasn't me. That was, that was me taking every perspective around me and manifesting it outwardly, never knowing who I was in here. And all this had ever learned, the brain, was everything around me. It was my heart that I had just been ignoring all those years. And on July 4th, I learned that things flipped. I said it was 180 degrees. I think most people live out of their brain rather than their heart. There comes a point in time when you can forgive yourself for all those things that you've done and you have an understanding of it where it flips. You start living out of your heart instead of your head. And you learn how to tell your head, piss off, get out of here, because I live by this. I don't live in, in that, that realm anymore. So I went through that, that phase of forgiving myself first on July 4th, asking for forgiveness from my family and, and, you know, friends through Facebook and through the postings that I made, you know, about what I was going through on, on July 26th, um, asking for forgiveness from them. And that literally opened up my, my journey. So again, I could look backwards now and I forgave myself for all of those things that eliminated depression and anger. Depression and anger were gone. I was no longer depressed about anything. I was no longer angry about anything because I had an understanding. And it was all about that understanding and forgiveness. And now on the flip side, I started looking at my anxieties and fears. Why, why am I afraid of something I have no control of? Why do I have, why am I anxious about the future? There's, I, I can control this conversation <laughs> with Willie and Greg right now. That is the only thing in my life that I have control over. Nothing. So for me to, to, to invest any kind of emotion to the future that hasn't even happened yet, I'm not saying don't apply strategic thought and planning to your future, but for me to um, allow myself to any kind of emotion to the future is absolute batshit crazy. That's the craziest thing in, in the world is being anxious and fearful for something that hasn't happened yet and that you have no idea about. And you had it, an epiphany. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. You, yeah. you had an epiphany. A, a inst, you instantaneously had the Big Bang Theory. Boom. You realize it. All your thoughts, all your travel, everything that has been waiting and piling up at the gate got released at one time when you came to that understanding. I live in the now. Now, now, I don't live backwards. I don't live forwards. Right. I live right now. And that's it. And I, I, think I make every decision from my heart. And if you, if you make, if you're living the right path or if you're on the right path and you're making the right decisions for the right reasons, you never look backwards. You never second guess yourself. When you're ready to s click send on that email, you know that your heart has written that email and it was being written for the right reasons and you click send and you walk away and you know whatever happens is supposed to happen or it, you know, it can be anything, but it, it's totally learning how to live now, letting go of the past, letting go of your hate or, or your, your animosity towards others for what they've done to you and what you've done to yourself. And then on the other end of it, forgetting about the future because it's, you have no control of that. None. You can control now. Now you can, you can, you make the right decisions and you might be you have might, the foresight to right, actually to, see the future and where, to, how it can manifest because you know, you that know. you're going to make the right decisions. You know, you're crafting uh, it. Absolutely. You're and craft. that's what you guys are doing here. You know, absolutely. you're doing the right things. You're making the right decisions and, and things are moving forward and your path is moving. My path is moving forward, man. Did you know today, man, I, I just say, I'm going to give all honor to God, man. Cause bro, I'm going to say that. I, w I never imagined you five years ago. I didn't even imagine you a day ago. But it seemed like when you popped up in here and today that I've been knowing you for a while. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Does it same so thing. That, let me know, that let me know that there's outside, that God's got powers outside of this. Unbelievable powers. That is, is directing and carving the path to lead to one destination. 
you know what's so funny? Greg came to me and he keeps saying, like, hey, man, you know, have you talked to this person about the podcast? Because he, Greg talks to people about the podcast a lot. What I mean, what I mean is, like, guests, giving people on, getting people to do interviews. And I was like, no, nah, I don't really – like I'm at places and I'm, I'm, I meet all these different interesting people and they tell me something and I don't phase it to like, Hey, let's do the podcast. And I was like, you're the first person, legit first person other than my friend, Carrie, first person that I actually like, I'll say, I'll say you're the first person I met out. That'll be true. First person I met out that I actually said, Hey, you know what? I think I would want you to come on the pod and do a podcast with us on the show. So like that was be- because Greg came to me and kept saying, you know, why don't you talk to these people? Why don't you bring them to the studio? Why don't you try to get them out here? And I've never attempted to do that from somebody outside of who I knew, you know, currently. And I, like, went straight to you and said, hey, man, come do this podcast. That has to be God. That's 100%. Brett, give him credit when credit is due. Give him his credit. Give him his flowers. Give him everything which is due. Because you know what? Not only that you talk to someone. You also, God knows what you and who you need. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and I've heard this stuff my whole life, and I've never believed any of it. I was actually a deacon in the church for a couple of years, and it was to me it was all bullshit. I was doing it because that's what my parents told me, or that's what the community said at the time. And and you know, it's I've never believed it un- until just these last five months. And you know. And, and, you know, so a lot of people don't see us for real. You know, you know, he said he come from a country, form, probably didn't have many black folks around you. I, I don't remember that time. It was it was early. You don't remember seeing black people. You don't remember seeing <laughs> well, black people. That's, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's probably, a, that's probably a good answer. <laughs> yeah, don't remember now, seeing Well, once we moved to Florida, obviously. I mean, I grew up yeah, in the urban yeah, community. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm just saying, though, in his, in his, his, uh, in his beginnings— you, you know, you didn't see it. And how you bring people from different cultures and bring different perspectives and all for the good, bro. Yeah. All for the good. And, Absolutely. And, and God has been great to me. I, I, I've yes. had opportunities. And I've, I've done some wild things that I, I look backwards now and, and that it's almost like a Forrest Gump life. You know, I, I went to China for a couple of weeks and opened up a new company, you know, as part of PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was a very involved in acquisitions. Um, went to China for a few weeks, went to India for a few weeks. So got to learn cultures that you n- I never would have, you know, had any interest in. So a few weeks in Shanghai and a few weeks in Bangalore, that'll give you some perspective on, on, on your world. Um, I've been to the top of the, the, the highest mountain in the Rockies and I had no business doing that. I, I did it out of a promise, a promise to, to my current partner that if I could make it to the top, then we're going to make it. And I made it to the top and I should have died on that damn thing. There's no way I had any business thinking that, hey, just because you can run a half marathon, you can go climb a mountain. And I did it. And the guy that I went with, who was actually a skilled climber, quit. He didn't make it to the top. He was like, hey, uh, props to you if you can keep going, but I'm done. <laughs> and I, my, hold, my, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you say mountain? Mountain. Long's Peak, Colorado. Did you say that you had, did you have the skill? Mm-mm. You just walk. Okay. Oh, no, no. I, I, I. Climbed the, 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 especially the last, and anybody who knows Long's Peak, you can look, you can look it up on the, the internet. I got pictures of me standing on the top of Long's Peak. So, you know, again, this isn't, I'm not making shit up. Um, the, I, the last, <laughs> the last stretch to get to the top is straight rock climbing where you absolutely should be strapped to something because pe- people fall and die. And coincidentally, once I got to the top, somebody had fallen in that same spot. And I was able to stay up at the top for about an hour and a half because now you realize I'm at the top and I don't know how to get down. I got to go reverse of what I, I I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how am I going to call a helicopter to come get me? And I had, so this, did you climb down? I did. And <laughs> un- unfortunately with the fear of looking at the person below me, two or 300 feet, however long that had fallen. And, and there's now, they don't have re- rescue. Can't just drive up and so you got these guys who are really trained running with a, and it took them an hour and a half to get to this person to pick them up and then try to, you know, carry them back down. It it was wild. And now I'm following that to go back down. And I'm like, man, I'm going to die. <laughs> I, uh, I had the same thing happen, but I mean, I wasn't probably as high as he was. I mean, I wasn't on a mountain like that, but I was on a grand, I was in a grand Canyon and they have these like little peak, little hills that you can climb up on and people go up there so they can see down further and whatever the case may be. You know, they always tell you stories that people have died 
trying to look over the edge and everything like that. And so, like, I'm going up to this little mountain, little thing, whatever. I'm going all the way to the top. It's easy to get up. It, like, it it doesn't look hard at all to get up. You're like, I can get up to this thing, no problem. I can get up. People standing up. And once they get up, they standing up. And I'm, like, almost, like, nervous to stand up. I'm, like, so I finally stand up. And I was, like, I go right back down. I was, like, okay, I need to go down. So the way you go up is different than the way you go down. Because if you go up the way you, if you go down the way you went up, you would definitely slip down because there's nothing to grasp on. Everything is like you pulling to get up. So there's nothing like to hold you when you're going down. It's the, it's the opposite. So you got to now find a direction to go down. And when I found the direction to go down, I get down and I go down to like my left and it's the end of the like mountain area. There's no, there's no walkway. I can't get off that way. I have to then climb back up and go down a different way to get down. Dude, I was terrified. I was like, I'm going to die up here. I was like, this is the end. Like, I'm like, this is the stupidest decision I made in my entire life. Like, I knew for a fact, I was like, I'm going to die up here. So, like, I was lucky enough to figure out, how, figure out how to get down. One thing Jeff said, and I always say, see, he uses that to propel him to, the, to what, whatever comes his way. Man, I can do this. I can do that. If I if I can go through this, I can overcome this. Mm. And that's what it was. It was a promise. It was, and you see, yeah. and and you see, and that's the first time I heard you say this, Will. That you did that. That you went a situation which you could have lost your life. That something that you went through that's significant. You did, and you don't use it, and I don't hear you use it a lot. Oh, oh, propelling me for the next yes. part of my life. You know, that's a that's an interesting thing to think about because, like, it, it I don't. I don't use that like that. I use that as, like, man, that was a dumb mistake. I should have never did this versus using it as, a like, hey, I conquered this, and look now, I'm going to go conquer something else. Because, but I, but in reality, I, I have done it, but not in the same way. I haven't used them. I didn't make one relate to the other, but I did in, in a sense of, like, did something that I'm fearful of that I knew I probably shouldn't be doing, but I did it anyway. But I never correlate the, that they both go hand in hand. Hey, because you did this, this should propel you to be able to do this. You know what I'm saying? Not always life and death situations, but, like, to make me feel okay about doing this. Like, hey, you don't have to be afraid of doing this because you you did this. You conquered this. You can do this. It wasn't? I never looked at it that way. I always looked at it like, hey, in this moment, you want to you want to overcome a fear. Period. That's all I looked at it like. In this moment, I want to overcome a fear. I never looked at it like, oh, because of this, it propelled for something else. And that's where I feel like I have room to grow. And this is why this this podcast also is important for have that discussion because that's room for me to grow to understand. Hey, you've done these things. These are things to say you can't do. There's other things you can't say you can't do because you've done these things, and these were worth. Harder things to do than this. You get what I'm saying? So you're absolutely right. I feel like that time's coming, man. This is like, that's the importance of having this conversation. Let me give you a, a, a secret, Will. Um, when you're, everybody's heard of PTSD and, you know, yeah, we can all look back at every traumatic event in our life and, and you could probably, by modern day standards, chalk, you know, chalk in some PTSD there. Um or, or just any traumatic event that you've lived through that still resonates with you, whether it's just somebody that, that treated you wrong or, or you, you, any of those things that I was talking about, forgive Qualif- put them all in one big bucket and start pulling them out one at a time. And instead of looking at it through the glasses of looking at the fear that you were experiencing or the, the, the anger or whatever, look at everything for, for post-traumatic growth. Look backwards on your life. Take every single significant event that ever comes up and resonates to you and figure out how you grew out of that and replace your brain, replace the database where, where there's an entry there about negativity, whether it's fear or whether it's, I can't believe I did that. That was so stupid. Like, what was I thinking? Every single scenario where you can qualify any of those things, you always learn. You've, you have lessons to pull out of every single one of those events and rewrite your database to where all of those events are now growth experiences. I learned how to grow by stealing grandma's car. I learned how to grow. I learned the impact of what I was doing to others by putting those shopping carts in front of people's cars. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I look at everything you've done and figure out a way that, that you've grown either then 
Or if you haven't grown from it, you now know the secret. Figure out how you can grow from it. Like, damn, I should have done this instead of that. And now what happens is every single time, even if it's somebody in your face that, that, you, that you've had debates with or, or have had heat with come at you with something that you've already processed, it doesn't matter. You pull that experience up when your brain goes to that experience and you can now handle that person across from you in a very different way than what you have, because you're not, you're no longer going to that, sure. that angry, you know, whatever it is that, that has caused you to hang on to the, the, the poor, you know, the, the yeah. shittiness of that situation. Uh, that fight or flight, fight or flight right. response. Basically. And you, you, you pull up a positive experience and then, and then let that guide your interaction with that person. Or in, in a lot of cases, you never interact with those people again, but let it go. And whatever you're hanging on to, just let it go. Find the growth in every single thing you've ever done. File it away in the database to replace all the negativity. And, and you've rewired your brain. You've rewired your brain to look at things from a different perspective. That's a, that's a great, great, great observation right there. And you, and you know what? And you can start right today. Absolutely. Like you started July 4th. It was like that was a moment. And then a moment and instantaneously... You, you, you break down the chains off of you and you can excel. Sh you can slingshot yourself to whatever you're going right away. Right away. Yeah, and we all could have a July 4th moment. Absolutely. Or September 10th moment. Yes. Or okay. September 15th. I say that because it's my birthday moment. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could always have a moment, though, like like a moment of uh, of clear of uh, having clarity, mm -hmm. you know, having clarity to, to grow. You know, an, an example of that is like I, I could, I could legitimately murder myself into a, a a state of depression that could go beyond anything I could even imagine by looking back and punishing myself for the lost time that I have with my mom, hmm. or that that I'll never have with my mom again. Yes. However, yes. looking at that through that different context and w what growth came from that experience from my mom. As and I said. can now look back on all those traumatic events that I went through where every time, and she was like, Jeffrey, God has a plan. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, God has a plan for you that I always thought was bullshit. And I know now is, you know, it wasn't, but I, I, I pull away those growth experiences and, and the growth experience right now is had my mom not done that, I wouldn't be here. That's true. And, and again, I, I will never look backwards on my time with my mom and, and, in beating myself up. Like why I should have done this, should have done it. it Everything in life is a mirage. Yes. You, you have a DVR to look backwards on your life and you have literally a fantasy to look forward on because mm. that's all it is, is a fantasy. You, and so you're going to, you're going to tell me you're going to live your life through a DVR and a, and Disney world, or how about eliminate both of them and come to right now, start living right now. I think a lot of people need to hear that message. Yes. A lot of people. Yes. We, we do so many things that's got dust over it. All we have to do is shine it off again. All you got to do. And then those things will come through. You know, that's the reason why I, I feel like, hey, hey, people out there that's listening right now and is going to listen to this, um, you know, we open to for you to come in and discuss and tell and express. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? God is going to pick this on a flight. And we're just going to do, and we're going to touch many of people, man. 100%. God, you got to believe that. So, till next time, if you can sing, cook a clean, and anything, anything in, in between, between can be heard on Higgs Radio. I thank you all for the opportunity to bring me on. Thank you. Appreciate it.